This is Rogers TV, Ottawa. Number one for local news in Ottawa and the Valley. This is City News, now on 1011 FM and 1310 AM. It's Wednesday, April 7th. Good morning. I'm Andrew Boyle. Right now in Ottawa, six degrees in Smith Falls, it's four. Here's what's making news in Ottawa and the Valley. New tougher measures coming this afternoon to the province to deal with rising COVID cases. The very latest we'll have for you coming up very shortly with City News reporter Kevin Meisner. In the meantime, amid the soaring COVID case counts, a stay-at-home order, there are hopeful developments on the vaccine rollout. Here's City News reporter Jamie Pulfer. It's the vaccine news you can use. As the age of eligibility drops across the province, that means those 60 years and older can now book appointments on the Ontario portal. Those 50 years and older are now able to get shots in areas considered hot spot communities. The Ford government has released a full list of postal codes. The majority are in the GTA. The full list posted at 680news.com. In York Region, the age drops even further. Those 45 to 59 years old can now get a vaccine in five hot spot areas in Vaughan and Markham. Register through the York website. Over 4 million vaccine doses have been delivered to the province. Just over 65% have actually been administered. I'm Jamie Pulfer. Now the Ottawa hotspots at residents 50 and up can book their appointment now. According to the province, our postal codes K1T, K1V and K2V. The city says it's still going ahead with the 21 neighborhoods it's already identified as hot zones. Now more on those tougher measures on the way. Here's City News reporter Kevin Meisner. Ford government is going to announce a province-wide stay-at-home order along with the closure of non-essential retail and new restrictions for big box stores. We have confirmation that the Premier will be making the announcement at 2 o'clock this afternoon and will carry it live. Now, Premier Doug Ford was hoping that putting the province into a grey lockdown shutdown would be enough to slow COVID-19 cases. I think we made a massive move uh, last week by basically uh, shutting down the entire province, but we're going to have further restrictions. Uh. And Ontario's Chief Medical Officer of Health, Dr. David Willis, says he did previously recommend the stay-at-home order and suggests it's only happening now because that's the process. Some of those things like the stay-at-home order involves a, a lot of regulation and legislation, so these things have to be walked through with due diligence. Now, a source uh, says the stay-at-home order will be in place for a month. It goes into effect at a minute after midnight tonight. Ontario's previous stay-at-home order went into effect January 14th. It was lifted nearly two months later on March the 8th. Right now, there are 510 COVID-19 patients in Ontario intensive care units, the highest level seen in this pandemic. I'm Kevin Meisner. City News Time 903. Now your forecast with meteorologist Jill Taylor. Temperatures well above average for us today, tomorrow and for Friday, even into the weekend as well. Plenty of sunshine, 19 the high today. Partly cloudy tonight near 6 degrees and tomorrow up to 21. But we will have a stronger east wind tomorrow. For today, the high, 19. And right now in Ottawa, 6 degrees in Smith Falls, it's 4. Federally backed Future Skills Centre is spending $32.4 million to fund 65 projects. They're designed to help workers affected by the pandemic improve their skills and find jobs in high growth sectors. The center targeting training programs that will help women from visible minority groups, indigenous people, newcomers, and youth. City News Time 903, a Renfrew County and District Health Unit advising Arnprior residents of a low-risk COVID exposure at the Metro. The health unit says the individual associated with the store tested positive for the virus earlier this month. Out of an abundance of caution, officials asking those who were at the store at 375 Daniel between April 1st, 7 in the morning and 4.30 in the afternoon and April 3rd between 7 and 12.30 to self-monitor for symptoms. I'm Andrew Boyle. For news anytime, follow up online at ottawa.citynews.ca. He's got the news and the views. He's got views on the news. It's the Rob Snow Show on Rogers TV and City News. 1011 FM and 1310 AM. How did we end up here? 
More than a year after the first lockdown, more than 100 days after the second lockdown. How do we end up here? Just hours to go before we're locked down again. We're going to try and get some answers to that question this morning. And good morning. Welcome to the Rob Snow Show on City News. You know, it was called for last week by experts. Voices grew louder on Monday. Louder still on Tuesday, yesterday, and now here we are. It's Wednesday, and uh, wow, you listen to our newscast, right? It is uh, about to come to pass. A stay-at-home order is coming into effect for the entire province. It will go into effect at one minute past midnight tonight if the reports are accurate at all, and why wouldn't they be? And a stay in place for uh, at least the next month. And as I was getting ready for the show this morning, I I just kept thinking to myself, why are we in this position? How how did we end up in this position again? You know, I don't want to play the blame game, but, you know, there might be a little that going on this morning. How is it that we have to go through this again? For the third time. Let's hope it's the last time. And maybe that's another question I should throw into the mix today. Do you think this is the last one? Is this the last time? Is this the last lockdown that we'll all have to suffer through? If, and if it is the once and for all last lockdown, does, does that make it any easier to deal with, to cope with, to accept. How do we how do we end up here? How do we end up here? That the Premier of Ontario is about to do this again. Probably feels no choice that he has to do it again. Province wide stay at home order. I don't know. How do you picture it? Um Let's say you're speaking with someone from another part of the country. Maybe they're in the Atlantic bubble and they're looking at Ontario and they see chaos in Bedlam, wondering what the heck is going on in Ontario. Or maybe you're speaking with someone from another country altogether. The United States, for example, or Israel. Uh, And you're having a conversation and they're asking you, why is it uh, that you are going in the wrong direction? You're going into a more severe lockdown. What would you tell that person? How would you explain it to them if you were talking to them you know, on the telephone or doing a Zoom thing or FaceTime? Friend or family member, what would you tell that person? Would you say, it's all Trudeau's fault. He really messed it up. Especially the vaccine rollout. Wasted all kinds of time with a Chinese company. He didn't invest in any domestic vaccine manufacturing. We relied too much on this global supply chain, relied too much on shipments out of Europe, and, you know, now we're, we're way behind other countries when it comes to vaccinating our, our people. Maybe. A lot of people are pointing fingers at Doug Ford now. The man can't seem to make up his mind but what he wants to do on any given day. You know, one week things are reopening. One week a meal on a patio is just fine. The next week it's the worst thing ever and you shouldn't be doing it. And now, in fact, you're not going to be allowed to do it. And he, he, he keeps saying... Ontario can do 150,000 vaccine shots a day, and yeah, it's all it's it's all they can do to hit half that number on any given day. It's Trudeau's fault. It's Ford's fault. Some people put it all on the health officials. Say they're they're panicking. It's all about overzealous unelected health officials. That's what some say. They've been given too much power and too much authority. One minute, you know, this just all unfolded yesterday. There's the premier. He said, schools are safe. Schools are safe. 99 and 94 one hundredths percent safe. The next minute, the local medical officer of health in Toronto is closing all the schools in Toronto. The 
premier says schools are safe and closed <laughs> because of a decision by an unelected health official who gives absolutely no notice to parents who are being put through this nonstop meat grinder of indecision. I mean, what is this health official saying? Oh, the schools were safe yesterday, but they're totally dangerous today. Just what gives? You know, and I don't have a lot of love for teachers' unions. Longtime listeners know that. But, uh, you know, I, I can't help but sympathize. That's right. Rob Snow said something nice about Ontario's teachers. How many, how many teachers have been vaccinated in Canada? In percentage terms. I mean, don't you think vaccinating teachers would go a long way to easing a lot of worry, easing a lot of fears, solve a lot of problems if, if, if teachers were vaccinated? The New York Times reports this morning in the United States, 80% of all school staff in the United States, 80% of all school staff, including child care workers, 80% have had at least one dose of vaccine. Doesn't matter how old they are, 80% of them, one dose of vaccine. What's the number in Canada? Is it anywhere close to that? I doubt it, right? I doubt it. it's anywhere near that number. How do we end up here? Doug Ford said yesterday he was upset to see so many people at the mall. And yet he's the premier who could have closed the malls. You have a clip of that, David? He could have closed the malls if he was really worried about it. Mr. Trudeau talks about a, a million doses a week. We're going to have a million doses a week. Our American friends are doing 20 million doses a week. 21 million doses a week going into the arms of Americans. The United States will achieve herd immunity probably by the 4th of July. They actually have reason to have a fireworks celebration in the United States. Here it's doubtful will you have a Canada Day again for the second year in a row. How do we end up here? Aren't we allowed to ask ourselves that on this morning as we get ready to spend another month under a stay-at-home order? For how long, ladies and gentlemen, I, I ask you, for how long has everyone in medical science been warning everyone in elected office there's going to be a third wave. There will be a third wave. Worse than the first two. It will be driven by more contagious variants. How long has that warning been out there? Every day for months and months and months, right? Months and months. And yet, look at where we are. How do we get here? Here we go again. Despite all the warnings, all the predictions, all the stuff that was staring them right in the face, here we go again. More suffering. Because of poor decisions made by people in leadership positions. More isolation, more loneliness. Poor mental health, children, goodness knows, goodness knows. Can you imagine the long-term toll all of this is taking on a, on a child's well-being? And small business, the entrepreneurs of this province, my gosh, after another month of this, what, what will be left to save? Stay-at-home order, in effect, midnight tonight. 
But finally, some common sense on big box retailing. You can only sell the essentials. I hope you enjoyed Ikea this weekend and all the tea lights that you needed. Very urgent tea lights. Essential. We have lots of coverage for that story today. We're all over it. Two o'clock this afternoon is the Premier's News Conference. We're all over that. I want your reaction. It is the biggest news story. Lockdown Part 3, the trilogy. That's why we do the talk back hour every morning here on the Rob Snow Show. Open up the phone lines at City News. Take your calls at 750-1310, 750-1310, Email the Rob Snow Show. At ottawa.citynews.ca. I mean, there have been calls for this very sort of thing. Lockdown, shutdown, stay-at-home order, curfew. We've been calling for it for days, if not weeks. Finally, Doug Ford is making the big move. Another month of lockdown life. This is the Rob Snow Show on City News. Papa Jack was started uh, uh, 14 years ago, really by accident, more than anything. Uh, a friend of mine had bought a grocery store, a popcorn machine was in there, he didn't want it, I ended up by buying it. My family thought I was nuts. When I first said, come and pick up this popcorn machine, uh, my son said, what the heck for? Uh, I won't use the exact words. But anyway, uh, we started and it just kept on growing and growing. Um, but at the time, I was the only one selling popcorn in Ottawa. But we persever persevered as a family, and here we are. So it's, it's been very, very rewarding uh, for my family and myself. And to see our brand name, Papa Jack, and Papa Jack came out of, I wanted something that was going to be very bilingual. So Pepe, and then in Ontario, everybody called me Jack, even though my name is Jacques. In, Ke in Quebec, it's fine, it's Jacques, but in Ontario, it was always Jack. So we married the two together, Papa, Jack. With the store that we have on Thurston Drive, um, it basically, the factory's in the back. If you come in to the store, you can see how the popcorn is being made during the week. So it adds an, an extra uh, layer of, you can see the sanitation, you can see how we do it. Um, it's not like making popcorn. Most people thought when I started this, I was making popcorn in my garage or in my basement. Uh, no, never did. Uh, it was started in this building, in the back of the building, and then we kept growing and growing until what we have now. My daughter and my son came up with a brilliant idea to do a fundraiser online. So basically all people have to do is to register here and we give them a special code number. And with that code number, they tell their friends, or their neighbors, everybody to buy online from us with that code number. And then at the end of each period, could be two weeks, could be a month, then we'll pay them a 20% of all the businesses that we got through that code number. One thing I'd like to say and is thank you to all the Ottawa people who have supported us and support local businesses. It, um, sometimes people, you know, they, uh, they talk about buying um, locally. Um, now it becomes that much more um, important to buy locally to support your local businesses because not too many of them are going to survive this. We're fortunate that we're so far so good. He's a pillar of community opinion. The Rob Snow Show returns on Rogers TV and City News. 1011 FM and 1310 AM. Let's turn our attention to city business now. And there is a meeting of the Transportation Committee today. And I found this item uh, of interest this morning. And I, I'm so glad that Orleans Ward Councillor Matt Luloff could join me this morning to, to speak to it because... One of the one of the recommendations that's coming out of a report is that the mayor 
uh, of Ottawa, Jim Watson, write to the mayor of the city of Clarence, Rockland, and the owners of Leduc bus lines and other intercity transportation providers to request more frequent commuter bus service into Ottawa once stage two LRT to Trim Road is is finished and it's all up and running. So uh, this has piqued my curiosity uh, on a, on many levels. And Councillor Luloff is with me, as mentioned this morning. Good morning, Councillor. Good morning, Rob. It's nice to be here. Yeah, it's, uh, thank you so much for taking the time. So uh, tell me more about um, this the Transportation Committee uh, recommendation here. Sure. Um, so what this motion seeks to do is to recognize that the Highway 174 is actually an intermunicipal highway. It's used by people coming in from Rockland and the rest of Glengarry Prescott Russell, despite the fact that it was downloaded onto the city uh, decades ago. So this is the 174 is, is owned by the city of Ottawa. It was downloaded to us by the province, despite the fact that it is operating as an intermunicipal highway. So many of the vehicles that are coming in from outside uh, of the city are single occupants. This jams up the highway for commuters uh, from Orleans and Cumberland who actually pay taxes in the city for the maintenance of this infrastructure. So what we want to see is the amount of traffic reduced on the highway to help with congestion issues and environmental concerns. You know, uh, my residents have to cross the Greenbelt uh, twice a day uh, in regular times to go to and from work. And when the highway is jammed up with people coming in from Clarence Rockland, it makes, uh, it makes for some frustration. So Stage 2 LRT provides us uh, with an opportunity to reduce that traffic. And that's why I'm asking the province to expand the park and ride capacity in the, at the terminus and asking Leduc and the mayors to our east to prioritize transportation to the trim road yard, to the terminus of the train, to get more people getting on the train. So this is going to bolster the use of the LRT. It's going to reduce traffic and GHG emissions to help ensure the long-term viability of the LRT. I want to see our out-of-town commuters pay their fair share for the infrastructure that they use every single day. So getting them onto public transit is a way to do that. And more and more people are moving out of town, yep. though they continue to work in the core. I mean, because of the housing prices, obviously, right? Yep. So yep. this is a means... Housing uh, prices, work from home, all of this stuff, right? Exactly. So it's and all so connected that, to me, uh, right? So yeah. yeah, and I mean, and this means that they're no longer contributing to the city with property taxes once they move out of town, and this is a way to encourage them to become ratepayers uh, by making it convenient for people to use public transit. Okay. Uh, so I'm not really familiar with Leduc bus lines. Uh, maybe you are, um, and the service that it provides right now in terms of inner city. Uh, bus service. What, what, what do you know about it, uh, Councillor? Yeah, so, so the Duke was running, um, was running in from the, from the outskirts of the city and bringing people into the downtown core. Um, so kind of like, kind of like Go Transit in, in Toronto, right, where you've got like people coming in from Mississauga and whatnot, so they hop on a bus line and bring them like downtown. Yeah. What this would do would be connect the systems. So instead of having people sitting on a bus in traffic, you know, blowing off diesel on the 174 and also jamming it up for for everybody from my community what the bus would do is come in from clarence rockland drop you off at uh at trim station which is the terminus for stage two you could get off and then not sit in traffic hop on the hop on the train and be downtown a heck of a lot quicker and that means that the people that uh that aren't able to use public transit because of you know their busy lives or 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 what have you um, would get an easier ride in downtown as well. I mean, I think it's a win-win situation, and I'm really hoping uh, that the municipalities to our east uh, buy into it. Okay. And don't you think, uh, uh, Councillor, you know, you're not the only Councillor, uh, you know, you're an East End Councillor, but you're not the only <laughs> Councillor who's going to be dealing with this, I don't think. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I think about, you know, you know they, there are quite likely people who have moved out of the city of Ottawa to to communities at the, the 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 outer stretch of the 416, you know, Brockville, whatever the Absolutely. case might be, right? I, you know, we know that the uh, the Valley communities, Renfrew, Arnprior, um, yeah. you know, outside the city, Almont, 
uh, that maybe this this whole inner city bus slash go transit model is going to have to have a maybe a serious examination, you know, citywide would, examination, right? So, yeah, and I would like to see that in the West and the South as well, too, right? The more people that we can get onto this multi-billion dollar investment, yeah. uh, you know, the better it is for the system. And on top of that, I mean, we're also, you know, doing the environment a favor here by not having so many vehicles uh, on the highway, right? I want the LRT to do what it was meant to do, right? Move people from the suburbs very quickly downtown and and make an impact on our environment and i think that the that that a way to make sure that we're doing that uh, is by including uh the you know residents to the south to the east and to the west of the city by having uh these bus lines drop people off at the terminus at the end of stage two stage three stage four as we as we continue right right right. so uh it says uh transit along highway 17 ottawa road 174 corridor transferred to the lrt at the trim park and ride facility this would kind of be the the vision right um what is what what's the plan for that trim park and ride facility what's there now what's the plan what would you like to see there yeah, sure. So, like, do you um, want a parking thing, garage kind of thing there, or what do you want? Uh, yeah, exactly. I mean, like, you know, we we, we drive, uh, you know, during regular times anyway. When you're heading into Toronto, you can see kind of an Ajax where you've got um, uh, an opportunity for uh, to, to, to park at a go station, right, where you've got a bit of a parkade. Right now, it's, uh, it's surface-level parking. There are uh, a few hundred parking spaces uh, there now. But oftentimes, and during you know pre-pandemic times, and we'll see the same post-pandemic, you'd see that this this parking lot was was full by you know 7:15 or whatever, and, and and it's the same for for Place Orleans as well. Their park and ride, which is not even the terminus, right? It's it's uh, you know further down the line and the stop down the line would be full by 6:15, right? Mm-hmm. So I want to increase that parking capacity to encourage people, even the people that are driving, right? that maybe have to pick up kids after uh, after work. You know, they can take the train uh, all the way out of the city, you know, hop in their car, go pick up their kids, and then head home. So I do want to see a parkade there uh, replacing or augmenting uh, the, the surface-level parking that's there now. I think that it would make a big difference. So you've got people that are, you know, on the on the little Duke line, getting off there, getting on the train, and you've got people that are coming perhaps from farther out where... Uh, where Leduc doesn't serve, uh, dropping people off, uh, dro- dropping uh, their car off at Trim and hopping on, the, hopping on the train as well. Okay, uh, just while I have you on the line, I mean you sure. you you represent one of the one of the biggest wards in the city, and we know that yeah. there's a stay-at-home order coming into effect at uh, at two o'clock this afternoon. Uh, by the sounds of things, Premier Ford's going to announce that it's going to be in effect for another month. What do you think about that as a city councilor? Well, well, you know, the, the the up and down and the yo-yo, right, of going from, you know, the red to the gray to lockdown to to yellow, it's, it's been really difficult on people's mental health. Um, people don't know what to expect. Uh, they see the goalposts being moved. Um, I think that what, uh, what we really need to concentrate on is doing the things that worked last year uh, to stop the spread of this virus, right? And I know that people are sick and tired of hearing it, right? But we can't be seeing people outside of our households right now. I think that that's the top line message, right? Where it's like, it is risky. And yes, you may not feel symptoms, but you could pass that virus on to somebody else. It is so important that we limit contact with people outside of our household. And the problem is, is if you know we don't do that on our own, if we don't take personal responsibility for our own actions, you know, you have the, the the federal government or the or the provincial government step in and make that happen for us. I'd much rather, you know, us just be responsible citizens uh, and and stop the uh, the intermixing uh, of uh, of different households for a period of months so that we can get through this. You know, my daughter has met uh, her grandma uh, five times in her entire lifetime. Wow, She's eighteen months old. You know, wow. and it was all during the time that we were in in the green or in the in the yellow when people were allowed to see each other. Socially distanced and masked. I don't even think that they've seen each other's, you know, I don't think that uh, my uh, my daughter's seen my, my mom smile, you know? Hmm. Um, 
it, this is frustrating, right? It takes it takes a village uh, to raise a child. Our village is shut down, right? Um, and I'm I'm very frustrated by it. Uh, but I mean, the Ontario government needs to do what it feels uh, it needs to do so that we can get through this because uh, it's just uh, it just hasn't been working so far. Okay, thank you, Councillor Luloff. Enjoy the rest of your day, sir. Thank you yeah. very much, Rob. Bye bye. Take care. in Ottawa and the Valley. This is City News, now on 1011 FM and 1310 AM. It's Wednesday, April 7th. Good morning. I'm Andrew Boyle. Right now in Ottawa and in Smith Falls, 9 degrees. Here's what's making news this hour. 2 o'clock this afternoon, the Premier and top Cabinet Ministers will announce the latest COVID measures a stay-at-home order which will impact what you can do and what larger stores can sell. Roped off portions of big box stores, for example, you would be limited to purchases of food or at the pharmacy. That's expected to go into effect at midnight tonight. Hot zone areas expanding the COVID vaccination program. It means 21 areas of Ottawa already designated by the city have opened up vaccinations to those over the age of 50, the rest of the area over the age of 60. And urging from the provincial health minister now, after a record number of vaccines were delivered into people's arms yesterday, Christine Elliott urging people to sign up when it is your turn. Yesterday, there were 104,382 doses of COVID vaccine delivered. Elliott tweets, vaccines remain our best defense in the fight against COVID-19. City News Time, 9.33. I'm Andrew Boyle. For News Anytime, follow up online at ottawa.citynews.ca. He's the opinionated Ottawa icon. The Rob Snow Show returns. On Rogers TV and City News. 101.1 FM and 13.10 AM. It's time to score. Your political fix. Cam Holmstrom is back, consultant at Blue Sky Strategy. Good morning, Cam. Good morning, Rob. You're well these days? Taking care as best I can. Yeah. You're getting ready for the big lockdown, month-long lockdown, on the way, stay-at-home uh, order. Absolutely. Ready for this one. You're ready? Yeah, good. House full of toilet paper and everything. You're, you're all set? Okay. Oh, oh yes, we're Good hunkered. to go. Good to go. <laughs> you're hunkered. Okay. <laughs> Kate Harrison, uh, welcome back. Kate Harrison, Vice Chair of Summa Strategies. 
Good to be back. I'm loaded for bear with diapers, actually. Diapers, yes, yes. You have concerned. a new one. You have a new yeah. little one, right? Yeah, I yeah, do. Yeah. yeah. So congratulations. I haven't one. had a chance to congratulate you on that. Thank you yeah, very yeah. much. Yeah, we're well, not so much looking forward to being stranded at yeah. home with the ability to not do anything, but that's most people. Well, here we go, and uh, it's just uh, making the rounds on Twitter now. Queens Park Media reporting now that uh, along with the stay-at-home order. Uh, that Doug Ford may uh, declare another state of emergency for Ontario. I think that that's more for legislative purposes than than anything else. But uh, we'll find out more this afternoon in his two o'clock news conference. We're heavy into the uh, the federal politics right now this morning uh, on your political fix. I think we can all agree the Conservatives didn't really get the headlines that they were hoping for after their policy convention especially when it came to the the climate file. Mm -hmm. Climate change is real. Conservatives will do something about it. goes down uh, to defeat uh, by the rank and file. So, uh, Kate, let's start with you to welcome you back. Uh, The Liberals and the NDP are gearing up for their policy conventions. What do you think they're hoping to see when they read the papers or watch the political news media after the conclusion of their policy convention. So far, uh, some of the NDP ideas uh, before the convention has even started, for example, have been described as preposterous, anti-Semitic, and Trotskyite. (laughs) (laughs) I'll let Cam speak to those specific policies. That seems like uh, he'd have a lot of fun with that. No, but what struck me about the policy resolutions coming forward from both uh, both party memberships right now, because it is members that propose the policy, is not necessarily MPs, uh, which is the level of similarity between uh, what the Liberals were offering and what the, the NDP was offering. And it's not across the board. The Liberals have a very uh, curated list of policies. It's like 30 or so, as opposed to the NDP, which had about 500 to sift through. So um, what I think is going to be the, the headline, if you will, coming out of this will be uh, what plans the parties may adopt around a universal basic income or in the NDP's case, a guaranteed basic income. Okay. Uh, it seems yeah. to be pretty high on the priority list for both of those parties. I really do think uh, Singh and the NDP are going to have a difficult time uh, drawing contrast between what they are offering, what the Liberals are offering. This is an opportunity to uh, have Singh define a more progressive vision uh, yeah. for the party when he when he takes the floor and creates some of that light between his policies and Liberal policies. Right. But failing to do that, I don't know why voters wouldn't just go with uh, the bird in the head and keep voting Liberal because Justin Trudeau's totally fine to keep mowing the NDP's lawn when it comes to stealing their policy ideas. Right. So, um, Bo, we're the authentic progressives, the New Democrats. Yeah, more in touch and, you know, uh, okay. they, they. to be fair, they are the architects of most of these policies and the Liberals have just lifted them. Child care is, uh, sure. is okay. a good example. All right. What do you think, Cameron? I, I wouldn't disagree with that last part. And honestly, I, I don't think that's a bad place for the NDP to be in. The idea being, of, do you want the real thing or do you want the imposter? And as much as people have liked the imposter for the longest time, that isn't the case as much the case anymore. You've seen the prime minister's personal, personal approval numbers fall down, which is why I would argue you're seeing some incumbent liberals deciding this is the time to walk away and not run again in relatively safe seats. So that just kind of t- gives you kind of a feel where things are at. When it comes to the actual platform policy or the actual policies themselves, this is one. And then this is where the, the, the NDP and the Conservatives are very similar, in the sense that there's people who love their policy. You know, an NDP policy convention is an absolute policy geek out, and I am not surprised to see that there are so many resolutions on that on that on that docket. Mm-hmm. Frankly, some a lot of them are ones that have been there for the longest time, and I know Mr. Uh, John Iveson had a column on this, and I think it was a little hyperbolic in the sense that a lot of the stuff is stuff that's always been there because frankly, it's one or two people keep bringing it back and it never gets to the floor and it never gets voted on. Or if it gets voted on, it gets voted down. And I think if you're looking at the, the, the narrative for this convention, unless something goes wrong for the NDP, the narrative is going to be basic. It's going to be, look, you said we had all these crazy things up front. We didn't pass any of them. We didn't accept any of them. Okay. Whereas the conservatives had the reasonable <laughs> resolution in front of them and they voted it down. So I think there's something to be said for that. The only exception I would put there is... is and the, you so maybe one of the headlines could be, Kim, NDP, not as crazy as anticipated. 
it, no, but, but seriously, this, 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 this but Rob, seriously, this is not different or, or new for this party in any way, shape, oh, or form. No, I know. The six years. Right. But, but the thing is, the, the, the thing I would note, though, the, the one policy resolution that does concern me is, is going to be the discussion around uh, Israel and Palestine. Yeah. That is one of the very few fault lines within the NDP. I openly admit, I don't, and it's not going to be a pretty debate. I'm, I'm sad to see this come up again and again and again. Yeah. But there, are, there are people entrenched on this issue that want to keep dragging this out. Like to me, it, it, is, is this not the worst time in the middle of a pandemic to talk about this in particular? There are so many other things that you could argue would be more important to talk about. Yet, the, if that issue is not handled correctly at the convention that could become a very bad news story. I'm, I have faith that it will be dealt with, will be dealt yeah. with properly, because frankly, it has been in the past. I think there's, it, there's a lot at risk, I think, for the New Democrats. I, and I think back to um, 2015, Mr. Mulcair had all kinds of uh, momentum uh, until the Leap Manifesto crowd kind of started sucking up a lot of oxygen and... Uh, and I think that really took a lot of wind out of the sails of the the NDP campaign. That uh, look, we can't have the NDP govern Canada. Like, oh, look at some of these policies that they're some of their uh, leading you know, lights Rob, are promoting here. But, right? but you know, Rob, I, I'll, I'll put, this is one of the big differences between the NDP and the Conservatives. Right. Whereas the Conservatives do have, you know, we saw at their convention, a very strong social conservative further right group sure. yeah. that makes up a big number of the membership has a lot of power. Yeah. The further left in the NDP is relatively small. They do not have the clout. They've never been able to organize and actually advance their ideas. So they're allowed, I admit, as a leap crew and the Socialist Caucus weirdos, they are loud, but they are a tiny, <laughs> tiny group. And so to me, it, to, to put equivalence to it is not fair because, frankly, they've never been able to get these things passed. And I looked at, and yes, it makes a story. You talk about it because it's there, yeah. but it never actually materializes in policy for good reason because they don't have the broad support. I wonder if there will even be the same kind of coverage that there was of the conservative convention. Kate, what do you think? Oh, I doubt it very, very much. The um, media was kind know, of salivating over the conservative convention because it played into a, a big narrative about um, conservative internal bickering, leadership questions, all that kind of stuff, right? So, yeah, I think yeah. there's usually about four or five of those articles in the can ready to go at any time about how the conservative party is on the verge of collapse. So that was a, a convenient narrative, although a lesson learned that maybe the leader should speak after all of the policy resolutions are voted upon as opposed to before and then make it seem as though it's a, a rebuke of, of what the members have to say. So I, I think that there will be certainly less coverage. I do think, though, that the NDP is in a different place now than they were in 2015. In 2015, they were fighting for the middle. Uh, now I think they really are fighting for the left. The Liberals, I would argue, in 2015 had a far more progressive policy than what Mulcair was putting out there, at least what he was communicating. Yeah. I think when it comes to things like drug decriminalization, when it comes to things like systemic racism, uh, there is ground there for the NDP to talk about how they would handle these things differently. I think yep. of uh, maybe sex the, work, maybe so sex work and the laws around prostitution, these kinds of things, you know, so that too. Yeah, and, yeah. you know, I would I would go pretty hard on on Bill 121 in Quebec. And I know that there's been hesitancy to do that. But there are a lot of people, I would say, in urban centers, including outside of Quebec. Um, that would take an issue uh, with, with what's being proposed or what is in place there. So I think that the NDP might actually want to try and tack a little bit further to the left so that the Liberals become yeah. wedged on some Especially of Especially if, if Quebec is not the same kind of fertile territory it was during the Jack Layton days. So, you yeah, know, why not, not happen now, for right? them in Quebec, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Make okay. the play for Vancouver and Toronto. Okay, Florida. let's move along. Uh, with, with the country in the firm grips now of a third wave, provincial governments, as mentioned, announcing new lockdown, stay-at-home orders, states of emergency, um, Ontario, Jason Kenney yesterday in Alberta. Spring, summer election off the table now. What do you think, Cam? You already you you always said it wasn't going to happen anyway, but uh, so me you know and it looks like well, you win the pool. So well, but this is why this is exactly why so many things had to go right in order for that to potentially happen. And just the last year, we've not been so lucky to have so many things go right. And here we are. You know, we're in a lockdown. It's ha it's it's coming. Other provinces are feeling the same thing. And just the logistics of running a campaign in this environment, I don't I don't know how you do it. Like, I don't know how you do it safely or how the public accepts you're going to do it. 
ironically, I was reading a piece this morning that there are now rumors of spring provincial election in Nova Scotia, yeah. which I guess can kind of speak to the virtues of the bubble and what what they've done there. They get to go 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 along with the usual machinations that they like. But you know, when it comes to the federal team, yeah, like I think this should end the conversation for now. There's too ma- there's too many important things going on. Right now, an election is not what we need in this moment. We need to actually get this done. The question is going to be, can this parliament actually keep it together for the next few months and get through the summer in order to make that happen? Like, I, I, I'd hate to see you know, the government sticking its feet in and denying witnesses and you know, threatening a confidence vote you know, because they want to ignore the will of the House you know, and playing chicken in a moment like this because that would be extremely irresponsible on their part. Okay. What do you think, Kate? I still think it's not totally out of the realm of possibility. I mean, it would be more likely summer, certainly, than, than spring at this point. I, I also I disagree with Cam slightly. I don't think the Liberals care at all about the logistics of running an election. Maybe they should, um, but I don't think that that's the, the equation for them. I think that why they would choose not to go is because people are not differentiating between between vaccine supply and distribution, and there are so many people upset by lockdowns, so many people that are um, think we haven't gone far enough, they're not necessarily um, laying the blame exclusively at Trudeau's feet or exclusively at Ford's feet. Uh, so they're kind of in this together in the sense that they have to deal with a, a very upset electorate right now over where we are relative to um, what's happening in the U.S. where they're, they could vaccinate the entire Canadian population in less than 10 days based on their numbers. So I think because of uh, the failures on all sides around vaccines, that would be the reason not to go because I don't think that there would be much enthusiasm uh, for for how either government, and, and that includes the feds, have handled this situation. Okay, when we come back, uh, a couple of big personalities that we'll talk about. Mark Carney, former central banker. What is he up to speaking at this uh, liberal convention? And the mayor of Calgary, Nahid Nenshi, uh has won three terms. He's not going to run again. What could be next for him? We'll talk about that. Your political fix here on the Rob Snow Show on City News. So the birth of Absinthe was uh, 2002, I think, 2003. And I was working at Urban Bistro um, happily uh, where uh, Allium is now. Uh, and then uh, the space where Holland Cafe was uh, came up. It's on the corner of Spencer and Holland. And uh, I spoke to the landlord, and there's a lot of interest from a lot of other people, but he and I just, you know, got along super well, and he put a lot of faith in me. So uh, Carmen Turner is his name. He, uh, he gave me the lease to the place and, and really pretty much gave me all the equipment in the place. So I was really lucky. I've been really lucky with landlords that way, actually, both my current landlord and Carmen Turner. Um, Because if there hadn't been Carmen Turner, there wouldn't have been Absinthe. So we were there for a few years uh, and just sort of outgrew the place. And then now we're here. It's obviously been tough and it's been tough for everyone. I mean, that's the, you know, for it's been the big democratic sweep of like in restaurants and the hospitality and the arts that we were talking about earlier. It's like everybody's been impacted pretty much the same. Um, from everybody that I talked to, we're down 80, 75, 80 percent. We're and we're climbing out now. Um, I think the one of the saddest things is like we like everybody. We went down to two employees from 25, um, and we're now at four, and we're bringing two new people on this week, so we'll be at six. So it's you know little steps. So it's been tough. It's you know. Um, I've got the most expensive uh, clubhouse ever here because some days you come and you don't do any business, but you're here. But I'm, I'm grateful for what I do have. I think everybody's optimistic now, um, n- not necessarily just about the vaccine, but about like the, the vaccine, spring, being able to be outside. I think you're going to see a lot of like pop-up things happen in parking lots and on sidewalks and all and like that rather than being actually inside somebody's commerce. I think we'd like to take it outside. Um, I know my staff would. My staff like the outdoors now all of a sudden, you know, all four of us, um, six soon. Uh, but um, we'll, we'll be doing stuff, some business in the 
patio in the parking lot and we have a patio up front. And I think other, and I hope other restaurants and stores will do the same. I hope that they take advantage of like the sidewalk and doing sort of, you know, uh, guerrilla marketing and stuff like that and really shaking it up a bit. You can find us at Absinthe Cafe at 1208 Wellington Street West in Hindenburg. And you can find us online at absinthecafe.ca. Strong voice. Strong opinions. Rob Snow Show returns on Rogers TV and City News. 1011 FM and 1310 AM. Part two of your political fix. We're always watching what's going on in the news, of course. Uh, the big teachers unions right now are having a big Zoom style press conference, news conference right now. Uh, give us a few seconds of that. That makes measurement even more difficult to do. But one thing we can see very clearly is that when we look for cases, we will find them. Now, in early February, the province announced a, a regime of testing 2% of kids uh, right. every single So we're going to follow up Colin um, Furness, right, Dr. Furness. He's been an outspoken critic of the Ford government and its policies on COVID and uh, education and the vaccine rollout. And uh, so we're going to follow up on that a little bit later, COVID and the education system. But we're talking about everything that's going on in politics these days. Busy week. Lots of interesting little side stories. For example, uh, Kate Harrison with us from SUMA, Cam Holmstrom from Blue Sky. What do you think Mark Carney is up to, former governor of the Bank of Canada and uh, head of the Bank of England, Cam Holmstrom? Is he, did he come back for me? Or, I know he didn't come back for you, Cam. Uh, did he come back for me? What, what do you think? Well, What's going don't on? Don't be so sure he didn't come back for me now. Come on. <laughs> Let's not assume anything at this point. Right. But let's face it, he's running. He's running. He's, he's doing running. everything okay. that you do. He's doing everything that you do before you make that leap from that kind of position into public into politics. He's speaking at the conventions. He's writing the book. He's doing the speaking tour. He's talking to all the media. Like this is what you do. The only thing that I feel bad for him about in this is it obviously draws the natural comparisons to Mike Lignatius, and I don't know how fair that is because he's not Ignatius. He's his own person. I, it's an easy comparison to make. It's fair in a sense, but it's not fair to him in the sense that. I think he, he actually has a better skill right. set and better. But where would he run? What, what's open for it? Uh, well, mm -hmm. uh, you know, there are rumors that he could run that he could run out in Carlton against a Pierre Polyev. You could drop him in any downtown Toronto riding, and no one would matter or no one would care. Personally, I think the, the 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 bold choice would be to have him run in the Northwest Territories, back where he's from. Why not? He's a big name. You have a big name in the West. If you're the Liberals, if you could pull it off. If he ever became leader, he'd be the first federal leader from the from the from the territory since Audrey McLaughlin. Right. There's a there's a good story to tell there if he decides to do it. Okay. All right. Wow. In Carleton. Okay. That would be a heck of a race. They would love to get rid of Pierre for sure. Um, what do you think, Kate? What's going on there with that one? I think at the very least he's testing the waters. Um, I do think that he's going to have a difficult time showing that he's got progressive bona fides. The party, the Liberal Party, in my view, has changed a lot since even Justin Trudeau won the leadership or was anointed the leader, depending on how you want to look at it. I think, you know, Carney would have been a really compelling choice at that point in time. I think the party's in a really different place now. Um, there's a lot more young people, progressives in the party, that Carney would have to really try and woo um, in order to to get their support, the the idea of a blue liberal coming in at this point, which some people would style him as, um, I, I just don't think that that's really where the party is. It certainly hasn't been where the Ontario, the party in Ontario has been for a long time. Um, we saw that with the Win and Pupatello mashup, and it's all Wins people that are now um, in the Justin Trudeau government. So I think that you put him up against uh, a Christian Freeland who would be able to champion a lot of the progressive. Uh, policies that the the liberals have brought into place, that's a that's a tough race, and I, so I, I'm not quite sure. Yes, the Ignati of comparison is there. Not quite sure what the um, value proposition is for a Mark Carney to the current liberal membership. Okay, all right, okay, cool. Um, Calgary Mayor Nahid Nenshi not running again for mayor of Calgary. What was the secret to his success, Cam? What do you think? 
honestly, I, I'd like to I'd like to think it's as much timing as anything else. Obviously, okay. organizationally, coming from a non-conservative background anywhere in Alberta, even in a urban center like Calgary or Edmonton, right. you need to be organizationally strong and have your message down. And he did. You know, he kind of came out of nowhere in that sense, but he he, he did. When you look at the campaigns that he ran. He did that right because he had to keep his his, his base firm. Uh, but I think it, it's the idea, though, that he he and Don Iverson of Edmonton is the other example because they're both retiring after this term. You know, they they started really that progressive wave you're seeing in Alberta, which eventually you ended up with an NDP government. You've seen other spots of progressivism throughout the province in such a staunchly conservative area, and I, I think it's been good for good good for politics in general, Canada. To see that you know what every region has, there's more than one, there's more than one view of policy out there. Yeah, but honestly, I think it's good for conservative. Well, policy, and when you're frankly. a big city mayor, when you're a big city mayor, you don't have to be. Well, you really can't be hyper partisan, right? No, you can't. But yeah. but also, I think it's good for conservative politicians to actually have to fight campaigns in places like that. You know, like I, I honestly, I live in an area that's heavily conservative. And there have been times here where conservative politicians have been caught with their pants down because they're used to just showing up and winning. I think it's good to actually have to have a have a fight and discussion and okay. actually defend it, even if you're going to win more than likely anyway. On uh, Mayor Nenshi from Calgary, Kate, what do you think? Yeah, th- I think there was really two things. I think there is a natural charisma to, yeah. to Nenshi, and he was uh, the second thing would be he was able to build a coalition. To Cam's point, the urban centers. Uh, of of Calgary and Edmonton skew at least a little more centrist than perhaps rural parts of Alberta, um, and and then she was able to capture those voters uh, while also still appealing to to some of those that are more conservative minded. Yeah. So uh, he was good at building a coalition. Uh, I don't think that he's done with politics. I think he was probably floating his own name out there for the Western representative that the Liberals were toying with putting into place. So uh, I don't think by any means he's done, but uh, he's got an an impressive kind of mix of, of knowing what it takes to win. And so he'd be a formidable competitor if he did decide to run provincially or federally. You could see him moving on to another level? So for sure. For I, sure. I think that yeah. even, um, I, I wouldn't rule it a Senate appointment or something to that degree as okay. well, or, or some kind of an appointment from the current Liberals anyway. Do you see him running for office at another level, Cam? Could you see that happening? Yeah. Oh, wow. Joining a party and being part of the party apparatus after being, uh, you know, mayor, mayor, the you know, the big boss and everything else. So, I, I, absolutely, oh, yeah? he's someone because of the name he built for himself, he can write his own ticket in that sense, right? right. Like he can step into a party, but he, he's going to be able to have his own space to work within that. And I, and I think the timing of his announcement is not lost; should not be lost on anyone. With all the rumors about a federal election sometime this year, this is about when you would make you tell people you're 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 leaving your current job if you're really thinking of going after another job. So the timing was not lost on me. Okay, all right. I wanted to talk about trying to pass the vetting process to even run for politics these days. I was talking to somebody the other day. What's involved with you know if you wanted to seek a nomination for a political party? It's quite something these days. Um, but we'll have to save that conversation for another day. That's an evergreen conversation right there. <laughs> yeah, it, <laughs> it is. sure is. All right. Uh, great to get caught up with both of you this week. Thanks again. Likewise. Take care. Yeah, Take care. Bye-bye. Uh, Cam Holmstrom from Blue Sky and from Suma, Kate Harrison. That's your political fix. The talk back hour. Talk back hour. Here we go. One month more, ladies and gentlemen, stay-at-home order comes into effect at midnight. Surely to goodness you have an opinion on that at 750-1310 on City News.
City News. CIWW 1310 AM in Ottawa. And CJET 1011 FM in Smith Falls and the Valley. Number one for local news in Ottawa and the Valley. This is City News. Now on 1011 FM and 1310 AM. It's Wednesday, April 7th. Good morning. I'm Andrew Boyle. Right now in Ottawa and in Smith Falls, a nine degrees. And here's what's making news in Ottawa and the Valley. Premier Doug Ford is set to issue a stay-at-home order trying to control this third wave of the pandemic. The announcement at 2 o'clock this afternoon, the order coming into effect at midnight tonight. With case counts topping 3,000 per day and more than 500 COVID patients in intensive care, Premier Doug Ford's been under pressure to impose tighter restrictions. Sources say the order Ford will announce this afternoon will take effect just after midnight and last for four weeks. After scenes of crowds packing shopping malls over the weekend, the order will make it clear that only stores selling essential goods are to remain open. Don Kelly, the Canadian Press, Toronto. Now, this is coming less than a week after moving the entire province into the gray zone. Renfrew County's top doctor says we are losing this fight with COVID-19. Here's City News reporter Alex Gouge. Renfrew County and District Health Unit Acting Medical Officer of Health, Dr. Robert Cushman, says Renfrew County is seeing numbers not seen at any other point in the pandemic. He explains there are significantly more high-risk contacts per case than ever before, signaling that people are socializing far too much. Dr. Cushman tells me because of that, a stay-at-home home order is necessary and 80 percent of the time it goes back to some bad behavior some ba- people doing stuff they shouldn't have been doing so we need this otherwise we're going to otherwise we're going to be in big trouble we need this while we catch up with vaccination he adds province-wide measures have their advantages since when some regions have restrictions that others don't people will travel Alex Gouge, City News. City News time, 10.02. We are expecting the latest COVID-19 numbers shortly from the province. And as the rate has been surging, the registration for age groups to get the vaccine is dropping. In hot zones, including 21 Ottawa neighbourhoods previously earmarked by the city, those 50 and older can now register for their shot. Everywhere else, it is now 60 and above. Demand is likely greater than supply, so the health minister urges you when it is your turn to register, do so and get on the COVID vaccine list. Christine Elliott tweeting this morning, urging people to sign up when it is their turn. Yesterday, she says over 104,000 doses, that would be a daily record in Ontario, were administered. Elliott says vaccines do remain our best defense in the fight against COVID-19. Now, what about the time frame between doses? The National Vaccine Advisory Committee is going to be providing an update very soon on the interval between that first and second dose. Our Parliament Hill reporter Cormac McSweeney will have more on this story throughout the day on City News. It's 10.03 and now your forecast with meteorologist Jill Taylor. Temperatures well above average for us today, tomorrow and for Friday, even into the weekend as well. Plenty of sunshine, 19 the high today. Partly cloudy tonight near 6 degrees and tomorrow up to 21. But we will have a stronger east wind tomorrow. For today, the high, 19. And right now in both Ottawa and Smith Falls, it's 9 degrees. I'm Andrew Boyle. For news anytime, follow up online at ottawa.citynews.ca. Talk back. Hello. On the Rob Snow Show. The phone lines are open at 613-750-1310. Now, the Rob Snow Show continues. It's coming. Here we go again. State of emergency. And an Ontario-wide stay-at-home order. Coming into effect, what do you think? 750-1310, 750-1310, 613-750-1310. Give me your reaction. We've been talking about it all week. And uh, why do you think we are where we are? Okay, That we're even in this position. Where are hours away now from going into another month-long lockdown? Okay, How do we end up here that we're going into a third lockdown? Maybe it's not time to play the blame game, but so be it. Let's play a little blame game, okay? How did we get here? Is it Justin Trudeau's fault, Doug's Ford, Doug Ford's fault, health officials? I mean, I mean, you're pointing fingers. Where do you, you need more fingers? You're running out of fingers. 
faulty vaccine rollout, uh, doses in freezers. Uh, Doug Ford's been accused of waiting too long to tighten restrictions. His government uh, filled with mixed messages. Uh, he was calling last week a shutdown when, when most people knew it was nothing of the sort. He had people flooding malls, big box stores. And then, and then he said I, he was upset that people went to malls and big box stores. Well, you're the premier. You are allowing people to, to go to malls and big box stores. Well, don't be mad at us. If you wanted them shut down, you could have shut them down. Do, you have, do we have uh, some audio? Yeah, play that, David. Yeah, go ahead. But a lot of people <clears throat> were going into the malls and doing their little wander around and coming out with no bags. So that tells me they're just out for an evening or a daily john. You can't do that. You know, if you have an essential item that you have to buy, and, you know, I'm sorry, but going to the malls is not essential. What's going essential to the malls is, is not going essential. to buy food, going to buy medicine uh, out of the pharmacies, and getting your vaccines. Well, that wasn't the rule last week. It'll be the rule as of tonight by the sounds of things. Okay. Some people point the finger at overzealous, overcautious health officials who think one case of COVID is uh, one too many. Okay, and maybe it is, but uh, we have, you know, we have this scenario now playing out, for example, in southern Ontario, where a decision by one person, one person never on a ballot, unelected, okay, health official, that's all it takes to close schools in a big city like Toronto. What the decision by one person. Okay. So is it the actions of one of these people, all of these people, one more than all the others? Is it all of them in combination? Just how did we end up here more than a year into this pandemic, more than 100 days after the last lockdown? More than 100 days into this vaccination program. Why are we here having to do this? Stay at home order. For another month. And do you think this is going to be the last one? Is this going to be it? Okay, please tell me this is it. Is this going to be it? Uh, Is this the last lockdown? If it's the last lockdown that you ever have to go through because of COVID-19, does that make it any easier to accept? Can you accept this? Okay, this will be the last one. And in a month, the vaccine rollout will be hitting critical mass. And look, let's just grin and bear it. Um, We can all enjoy summer. Okay, spring's going to be a bummer. But let's try and salvage summer. Last lockdown. Does that make it any easier to accept that it might actually be the, I mean, really, it might be the last lockdown. 750-1310-750-1310-613-750-1310. 103 days. As of tonight, one minute past midnight, it will have been 103 days since Boxing Day, since the last day at home order. You know, he was asked to do it. He was asked to do it, Premier Ford. They pleaded with him, right, to do it, health experts, health officials, and now he's going to do it, and here we go again, I want to know what you think about it. Stay-at-home order that will close. Most non-essential businesses come into effect at midnight. Latest that we have here at City News is from Cynthia Mulligan, uh, who is great at getting scoops out of the Ford government. Um... Ford is going to impose a state of emergency uh, for uh, merely for technical purposes. That is what allows them to impose a legal stay-at-home order. It has to be under a state of emergency. So Cabinet is uh, going to meet at 11 o'clock this morning, quote, fine-tune the plan. But she's been told this idea of banning travel from one region of the province to another region of the province is not part of the plan. It's too difficult to enforce. And that they're not considering a Quebec-style curfew. That's not uh, in the mix either. In Quebec, it's 5 a.m. Yeah, 8 p.m. to 5 a.m. is the curfew in Quebec. 
certainly limiting big box stores selling essential items only is under consideration as well as all non-essential retail being curbside only okay that's the latest that we have uh, out of Toronto. Diane Stitzville. Good morning. You're on City News, Diane. Good morning, Rob. Hi. Well, I, I have to accept what's going to happen today. I really like Dr. Etches, and I think she's a very smart lady, yeah. and whatever she says, I agree with. Okay, so I want to go to Trudeau. His, uh, his three words are build back better. Yeah. So first of all, he did do a good job when those airplanes came in from China, and he sent them to Trenton and other places to, to isolate. So that was good. But he let planes come in from other countries like the UK and someone brought the variant in from the UK to Ontario to Barry to the long-term care place there. So he should have been cutting back more of those airplanes, right? And we should have gotten vaccinations here sooner. Um, money that went to the CERB um, for 15 to 20 year olds that were still living at home, maybe that money could have gone to Amazon workers or gateway uh, post office workers to reduce the number of people there. Yeah, um, yeah good point there. I, I think that um, Ontario is larger and bigger than most countries in the world. And we got, we're getting too much, uh, too much of the vaccination all at once. So people are complaining this week that we're not getting them in the arms fast enough. And finally, um, the poor areas in the cities are finally going to get vaccinated first. In, you know, so there, it was on the uh, news last night, certain postal codes, yeah, they're yeah, going to get yeah, the vaccine. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, and I agree. Costco, all those places, just essential. Just essential items only. Yeah. You're, you're good with that. Okay, yeah. thank you. Thank Thanks. you, Diane. Well, yeah, yeah, very good. Okay, thank you for your call. So there's a, cl- a clean line for you right there, open line there. Uh, Ottawa, Jessica. Jessica, good morning. Hi there. Hi. So... Oh, I guess my other radio is in the background. So oh, I think good. that it will be the final lockdown if we just do it right. Okay. I, I think that the, there's a lot of half measures going on, and I kind of get it because the politicians and public health officials are trying to balance between people's livelihood and, pe- and public health concerns related to COVID-19. Yeah. And I think that we should have done this for a while. Like, I find cases go up when things are reopened. And then when we lock down, cases go down. We need to have an extended real lockdown where Costco, Walmart, they can only sell essential items. Because why are the, uh, you know, why are we able to go to Costco and buy jewelry, but people's and burn Yeah, but if you stores. own a jewelry store, you can't open and sell jewelry. Exactly. Right? Yeah, exactly. Sure. So why can, why can we do that at Costco right sure. now? It's not fair to the little guys. Yeah. And if we have an extended lockdown, it's an extended stay-at-home order. But in your head, you're thinking if it's the last one and it's done right, I, I can deal with it. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. If it's the last yeah. one and it's done right, it'll allow us uh, the time to ramp up the vaccination campaign. Right. Then I think if we do it right, this could be the last one. But if we don't do it right and we open too soon, then it's not going to be right. the last one. Exactly. Exactly. I hope they get it right this time, Jessica. And I do think that school teachers need to, essential workers need to be vaccinated. Teachers need to be vaccinated because kids are, kids are, may not have symptoms and they bring it to school and then people, yeah, that's yeah, how it yeah. spreads. Plus it would give a lot of people a lot of peace of mind. A lot of parents would have a lot of peace of mind, I think, knowing that the teacher was vaccinated anyway. Right. Right. Because in person learning is essential for children's mental health. That's why it's important to have teachers vaccinated. Okay. Thank you, Jessica. Thank you. There we go. Talk back hour. We are on our way to another lockdown. Stay at home order to come into effect at midnight tonight, two o'clock news conference this afternoon from Premier Ford. Your reaction, please, at 750-1310 on City News. An old-fashioned, traditional grocery store. You're going to find a butcher, okay? 
you want a steak cut a certain way, you're gonna get it. You know, there's flour piled in the warehouse, there's mixers on the floor, there's flour on the floor. Uh, the bakery is rented out to Frank Niccolo, it's him and his son come in at night, they mix the dough, they roll the dough, and they bake the dough. It's not the traditional uh, frozen and thaw and put it in the, in the bin, okay? It's made from scratch seven days a week. It's probably the only bakery left in Ottawa that does that. You know, then customer service, you know, we're, we're, we're big on that. The, uh, the cashiers, the, the deli, you're, you're not, if so, you ask for something, they're not gonna point, it's an aisle number seven, they're gonna bring you there, okay? If you have too much groceries out, we'll take it out to your car, you know what I mean? There's nothing we don't do for our customers. And we evolved around our customers. They would come in and say, you know, can you try getting me this? You know, can you get me this? So that's how we built the lineup we have now, okay? So we have a lot of unique items that someone that uh, uh, came over to, you know, live in Canada hasn't seen this particular product, but we sourced it and we have it for them that, you know, like something they used to have as a kid. We have a lot of those unique items, a lot. You know, uh, from Germ like all over the world. And we source it through, you know, uh, distributors in Montreal and Toronto that bring in the product in bulk and we piggyback off of them. Probably the, uh, the largest European deli in Ottawa. We, we're, we, we sell lots because people buy lots. It's nothing really complicated about that. You know, we turn over a lot of product. You know, we package it properly. We buy and we're always uh, consistent. You know, you're always going to buy, you know, cutty turkey breast. You know, San Daniel Mortadella you're always going to get the same brands. We don't flip back and forth to save 20 cents. It's always the same brands the last 29 years. Best sandwiches in town. It's simple. It starts off with fresh bread every day baked in the store. Anything that's left over goes to breadcrumbs. So you're getting a fresh bun every day that was baked probably four hours before you get here. Okay. Not only baked, made, like, you know, mix the flour, roll the dough, proof the bread, and bake the bread, okay? Then all the ingredients come right off the shelves. You know, your lettuce, your tomatoes, all your condiments, and they're cut up fresh in the deli. Not like the big, you know, ch corporate restaurant chains that your lettuce comes in shredded in the bag, you open it up and you throw it in the bin. You know, takes, you know, two or three days to get here from California, how long is it in the bag? The big difference is like making a sandwich at home and you don't have to do the work. It's really what the trick is and using the freshest ingredients possible. It's time to talk back. On the Rob Snow Show. Have your say and call now. 613-750-1310. Okay, top line numbers are in. Case counts. Ontario wide, 3,215, 3,215. Ottawa's number for today, 225, 225. Okay, close to a record, not quite a record. I believe the record is 240 now uh, for one day. Eastern Ontario health unit, 32 Kingston. I know Kingston's becoming kind of a local hotspot now, David. 22 cases. They used to go days and days and days and days without reporting a single case. Now they're reporting 22 in one day. They're having some issues with the students. The student partying around the university is the latest on that. Queens. Notorious party school. Leeds Grenville, 12. Renfrew, zero. But whether you have zero or 225 or 3,215, uh... We're all in it together, I guess you could say. We're all in this together. And what does that mean? We're all under a stay-at-home order. Together. So you certainly had a, a lot to say on this topic all week. I warned you yesterday it wouldn't be the last time we talked about it. Lockdown, shutdown, stay-at-home order. And uh, now it's actually happening. Most of the details leaked to the media already. It uh, only makes sense I get your opinion on what's about to happen as of midnight. Stay-at-home uh, order. Let's go. Where are we going? Bill. Bill calling in from Toronto. Bill. Hey, Rob. Hey, Bill. You know, the lockdowns have worked so well. Why don't we just lock down again? Lockdowns have done nothing here. Compare us to Florida. Florida's pretty much been wide open since day one. Okay. You know, their population is about 20 million. Land mass kind of the same size as Ontario. Right. So what's the difference? 
obviously what we're doing is not right. These lockdowns are doing nothing for Maybe them. pace of vaccinations is a big difference. You know? Well, I mean, the vaccinations are just, it's just a recent occurrence down there. They've been doing fine all through the pandemic and they've been open. The restaurants are open. You know, I, I've got a feeling it was the same thing this time last year. It was lockdown, stay at home, stay at, stay at home. Yeah. I'll guarantee you once the weather breaks and it gets nice and all these public health officials start looking out at the sun and want to get out and go enjoy their summer and take some vacation. Right. This will all settle down again. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. And uh, really, uh, we're looking at a disease here that kills what? Your survival rate is 99.7. Well, yeah, I suppose that's all well and good as long as you're not the one who's dying, Bill. Well, people die from uh, everything. Sure, yeah. Well, you know, we don't shut down economies because people get cancer or have heart attacks. Okay, Bill. All right. I know you're not a big fan of lockdowns, right? You never have been, right? You opposed the very first one, right? Well, they've worked so well. No, I didn't oppose the first one. You didn't oppose the but first one. This is okay. it's a continual lockdown. That's all it is. It, it's not lockdown. doing anything for us. Okay. All right. What, what, what should we do? And we have cases like this, 3,215 cases across Ontario today. Well, cases are one thing. What about right? the death? Well, the what, death about, what about the deal? situation in intensive care units, Bill? There are more than 500 people in intensive care. I, I know. I've seen doctors okay. out there. People in their you know, 40s are being intubated, Bill. Right? The, it, 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 there's a, many, a news report today. Many, some of these people, a year later, they've had COVID. They're still not the same. They can't work. You know what? You They're suffering long-term, you know, long-term, you know, they call, have these things, long haulers, right? What about, what about these people who are never the same after they get this disease? You'll never be out of a job as long as you can preach fear to the public and they buy it. Is that what you think we're doing? We're preaching fear? Uh, to preaching a large fear. degree. I think mainstream to a large media degree. does. Mainstream media. Okay. Blame it on the mainstream media. There we go. Okay. All right. Uh, Anne in Ottawa. Go ahead, Anne. Hi there. Hi. I'm, I'm happy to report I'm booked for my first oh, Congratulations. Go April ahead. 22nd. Oh, good for you. Pfizer okay. at the Sportsbox. Uh, yeah, it was kind of a hellish experience because I tried online and it kind of kicked me out, maybe because I went through Safari instead of Firefox. I have no idea. But finally, after waiting an hour on the phone, I finally got a human. Yay. And she helped me. My next appointment isn't until August. <laughs> But anyway, at least oh, I've got one. Until August. You're not going to get a second dose until August now. Yeah, wow. yeah. Okay. But I, I'll tell you one thing. I was not impressed that the province opened that up to six, 60 and up to 65 as well, because that's a huge group of people, 60 mm -hmm. to, to 69. Um, so, like, it was kind of a frenzy, like, hellish frenzy trying to get on. Like, it was crazy. Okay. When, when, I, when I went on first thing this morning, there were six, 6,500 people ahead of me. <laughs> and how long did the whole thing take to book? Um, well, once I got a human, uh, yeah, okay. I was on the phone from 8.15. Finally, I got someone at 9.15. Then when, once I got a human, it took 15 minutes, so an hour and 15 minutes, okay. I guess. Right. But, but then she was very done nice. Now. It's done now, right? Yeah. yeah. No, I guess so few. Um, but what I was going to say, I see a lot of the blame here. I mean, I see the province making lots of mistakes, and I'm not happy that they opened it up that much. I'm really going to voice that to them because um, they should have done it. But why not continue with the five-year age groups? Like, why not 65 to 69, you know? Like, okay. oh, we got screwed. All right. Um, <laughs> okay. All right, Anne. I mean, Thank you. No, I have something else to okay. say. Okay, very good. Okay. Okay. okay, a lot of this, the blame for this is on the lack of vaccines, and that is on Trudeau. I'm sorry. You can't not blame him for this. You can't. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Anne. Okay, bye. Thank you. Yep, yep, yep. Uh, I said yesterday, I, you know, I felt I, 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 uh, that there was a shift in public opinion when it came to tighter restrictions. It was, the margin on the callers yesterday, which may not be a reflection of what's, you know, going on uh, in broader society. I know that. But, but it was about two to one yesterday. People who called the show really did think that we needed tighter restrictions. You know, people like Bill were in the, in the decidedly in the minority. Um, maybe that was just a one-off. Um, maybe there is a shift in public opinion because of these rising case counts, increasing hospitalizations, spike in the number of people in, in ICU, Wh whatever. We're going to get the nitty-gritty details this afternoon. Two o'clock is the Premier's 
news conference, and uh, there's going to be a stay-at-home order. Uh, West End, Dave. Good morning, Dave. Good morning, Rob. Yeah, hi there. Rob, had I got in yesterday, I would have been a no along with the, for the rest of the no's. Right. Rob, who, No on a lockdown, you mean. Yeah. Honest. Rob, right. who are these people? Who are these 200 people? What do you mean, who are they? Well, well I don't have their names. Exactly. We, and, and we don't know what they're doing, whether they're uh, observing the lockdown or not. Right. Okay? Th- yeah. th- they're the people that should be locked down, not you and I. You know what I well, mean? Well, I guess the, what the authorities are saying is that uh, if you're not abiding by the lockdown, you could be one of them, Dave. Yeah. Or I could be one of them. Well, right? there you go. So yeah. the lockdown isn't working. And the lockdown will reduce the well, 3,000 down to 500. Right. And then we'll open up again and the 500 will right. build no, up well, to well, another you just 3, by, Well, isn't that proof positive that a lockdown would work? You just said they didn't work. Okay, but well, if cases go from 3,000 down to 500, wouldn't you say they they work? No. No. <laughs> if, it, if it reduced it down to oh zero... Is there a brick wall around? People are Is there a brick wall around? Hold on, I gotta go. Hold on, Dave. I'm just gonna go find the nearest brick wall so I can drive my forehead into it. Good. (laughs) All right. Good. Yeah. All right, Dave. Bye. What is this made out of? That's. Not, not not nearly tough enough. It's drywall for this thing. We just had that replaced after the last time. Don't don't do that again. Come on. Nepean and good morning. Good morning. Yeah. Um, I called the prime hey, minister's Rob, office no before the last shutdown on Thursday morning. Hey, who's this? All right, Dave. You had to turn off your microphone there, Dave. Okay. Go. Sorry. Go ahead, Ann. Okay. Wheels just come. The wheels are coming off the bus here. Go ahead, Ann. Um, I called the Prime Minister's office Thursday morning just before he announced the shutdown. Oh, yeah? Did he answer the phone? No. No. It was an assistant. <laughs> and she, was, she, she listened very nicely, but I was very upset. Right. Um, I said, you know, if, if, if we've, we have got to do targeted, more targeted. If Costco can be open, I don't understand why we can't have small businesses open. I, 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 I just think that we are looking right. at the data in the wrong way. Okay. Right well, now. that's going to be part of this new stay at home order. Finally, the only place you're going to be allowed to shop indoors are in grocery stores and pharmacies. Yeah. And that's good. Okay. The, 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 and if yeah. you do go into Walmart, they're only allowed to sell grocery items and pharmacy items. But, but are we looking at the data the same way we did last year? Are we looking at the numbers the same way we did last year? I mean, the thing about the ICU units and and, and being so afraid to be bogged down, we have been dealing with the medical system for 42 years. It's been bogged down for 42 years. Right. Okay. Okay. Yeah. There is. It has. It has. So now, uh, yeah. So now throw 500 COVID patients into the mix, Anne. What do you think that does to it? We we have an email here. We've been running the news story all, all morning. Uh, not, uh, non-urgent elective surgeries canceled at the Queens by Carlton Hospital. So how long is it before that happens at the Ottawa Hospital? The now, problem. now, what's non-urgent elective surgery to, uh, to you know, to to a healthcare bureaucrat is probably a uh, urgent surgery to the person who need waiting for a cataract or a new knee or a new hip or whatever and is experiencing a great deterioration in their quality of life. This I is agree. the kind of cascading effect that this is having throughout the healthcare system. But I agree. But what we should be talking more about yeah. is about the healthcare system itself. <laughs> That's one thing we should be talking about. Well, yeah. And sure. the other thing is, I did. We did go online this morning to get yeah. our uh, shots. Yeah. And it went really well. We waited thirty minutes. Okay. And we, uh, there was no problem. Good deal. But I think I think these lockdowns. Toronto has been locked down for three hundred and some odd days. It doesn't seem to have helped much there. I, I I don't know what the solution is, but I'm thinking that we have to start thinking a little bit about the. Outside the box. Outside the box. I okay. don't know what the Outside the, the big is, box. Outside the big box. Yeah, okay. Yeah. All right. I got to go. Thank you. The 1030 News is coming up. Halftime. Rob Snow Show. Talk back hour. Lockdowns. Stay at home. Order. Shutdowns. Back right after the news. City News.
Good morning. I'm Andrew Boyle. Right now in Ottawa, 12 degrees. It's 13 in Smith Falls. And here's what's making news this hour. Ontario's cabinet meets in about a half an hour from now. They're going to fine tune the new stay at home orders being delivered to all areas of the province at two o'clock this afternoon. And they will take effect at midnight tonight. City News has learned the stay-at-home order will reduce shopping, closing some stores, and limiting what can be sold in the big box stores to essential items only. There will apparently not be a restriction on movement between regions in Ontario, and there will not be any curfew imposed. Again, the full details coming at 2 this afternoon. Latest numbers from the province of new infections of COVID-19 show an additional 3,215 cases and 17 more deaths. The positive cases come from about 49,900 tests that were completed. Ottawa City has 225 new cases today. Eastern Ontario Health Unit with 32. There are a dozen new cases in Leeds, Grenville, Lanark. No new cases in Renfrew. The hardest hit areas of the province, 1,095 new cases in Toronto, 596 in Peel, 342 in York Region. Those age 50 and older in 21 designated neighbourhoods in Ottawa now eligible to register for their vaccine. For everyone else, it's 60 and above. Provincial Health Minister says a record number of vaccines were delivered into people's arms yesterday. Christine Elliott urging you to sign up when it's your turn. Yesterday, the province injected 104,382 doses. Elliot tweeting, vaccines remain our best defense in the fight against COVID. City News Time at 1034. I'm Andrew Boyle. For news anytime, follow up online at ottawa.citynews.ca. Talk back. Hello. On the Rob Snow Show. The phone lines are open at 613-750-1310. Now, the Rob Snow Show continues. Garden centers will be allowed to stay open. Can't catch COVID at a garden center? Nothing new on schools, but uh, one by one, some of the big schools in Southern Ontario, school board, Southern Ontario, the local medical officers of uh, health have taken to closing schools with very little notice. Uh, That's the way the legislation works, okay? The Ontario legislation gives the local health officers that authority, and in in Peel and Toronto, they've gone ahead and, and used it. Not the case here in Ottawa. We had Dr. Etches on our program yesterday, Medical Officer of Health for Ottawa, and um, she said the schools are safe. They are not a driver of transmission. This Children are more likely to get COVID in the community than in the schools, and the same for teachers. The, the community transmission is what is driving COVID levels up, and it's what's introducing COVID into schools. So the schools are not the place where children are typically picking okay. up COVID. Classrooms are not a driver of transmission. Is that what you're saying? That's correct. Uh, you know, of all the people that test positive, when we send the cohort home, um, usually we do do not see transmission within that cohort. And we've studied that for variants of concern as well. We've asked uh, everyone to be tested when they've gone home and there's a variant of concern at play. And we did not find uh, that there was greater transmission in those situations. And that was yesterday on the show. Classrooms not driving higher case counts. Students in classrooms. Dr. Etches yesterday. Uh, nevertheless, lockdown on the way. Stay at home order is what it's being called. A stay at home order. There will be a state of emergency declared because you need a state of emergency in order to impose a stay at home order. Cabinet meeting starts in about 25 minutes uh, from now. There's not going to be a travel 
restriction imposed. That, that was one of the things called for, region-to-region region travel restrictions. That's not part of it. Curfew, not part of it. Big box selling only essential items, definitely part of it. One month for now, they say. Third lockdown. Steve in Canada. Steve, go ahead. Hey, Rob. Hey. Uh, Rob, last time I called you was right before a lockdown. Okay. I was sitting in the Centrum Park. So I'm going to hear I, I'll hear from you two or three times a year, I guess. So. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so I had said to you that I was pointing out all the stores that were going to be closed in a few days, but everyone, you get all that stuff at the Walmart uh, at Centrum, if you remember that. Yes, I do and, remember that call, yeah. Yeah, and so what, now what's happened is they've pushed it, and now they're going to shut down all these extra aisles. But are they shutting down Amazon delivery? No. Nope. Are they going to shut down uh, Canada Post delivery, where postmen are touching envelopes that are handled by both other other handlers and machinery? Um, are, you know, like the Simpsons predicted this, if you remember, years ago, where they had someone sneeze in a box and the package got shipped off to Springfield and everyone got sick, right? You know, and like I, I, I think that at this point, uh, someone mentioned it, lockdowns haven't stopped this spread. And if we had taken that two weeks to flatten the curve and taken all the money we've poured into everything and expanded, you know, uh, uh, extra hospitals the way they did in New York, they had that boat, they opened up the Javits Center in New York and all these different things to, to give us the room to manage these extra cases and we had ridden it out, we'd be in a different state. Now, that's looking back in hindsight's 2020, but states like Florida have stayed open and California has not. They've locked down drastically, and those two states have similar statistics. You can go look that up. Almost the same deaths, cases, everything. So I still ask what the science is. Yesterday I heard Doug Ford was going to shut down live stream venues, venues that would live stream concerts, meaning maybe someone sets up on stage and they live stream out over the Internet with yeah. no one in the stadium. Yes. How is that? Is I that don't. The there's a lot of things I don't understand. Like, like, this, thing. this, this just blows my mind. And uh, in the end, I just say to myself, and so my final point is when we look at this, again, my feeling is for all the people who are not going to get paid because their businesses are closing, their staff won't get paid, their lives are going to be drastically affected, and not just short term, but that means they're dipping into savings, they're not putting into their retirements. The effects of this will last decades. Mark my words. And, and, and the people that are going to be fine in all of this are the politicians and the government workers. And I think that it's about time that everybody demanded government workers who are staying home and can't do their job either do not get paid. And I appreciate the unions will fight that. But the reality is everyone is not in the same boat here. Some people are in yachts and some people are in rowboats with a hole and an and a empty bottle of Clorox to bail themselves out. And it's just simply drastic and unfair and I'm, I'm fed up with it all. all right. It's just driven me to the point of anger uh, hearing about this for the sake of all those people that are going to be uh, hurt for not just a year or two, for decades. Okay. Thank you for your call, Steve. Okay. Take care. Yep. Bye-bye. Ford uh, asked yesterday, Premier Ford, what, so much back and forth when it comes to your restriction announcements. You're announcing a shutdown last week and now you have a stay at home order. Let's play that from yesterday, including the reporter's question. Here, here we are in another situation where, uh, like last week, you're planning an announcement, uh, telling us about an announcement the day before. If you're going to shut things down further, if you're going to do a stay-at-home order, why not just tell everyone today so everybody knows where they stand? Because, uh, you know, I heard a lot of complaints over the weekend about uh, changes and everything moving from one day to another, and uh, people are just looking for a little more certainty, I think. Okay, uh, Rob, and I, I respect that. And I, you know something, I don't even disagree with you. I don't disagree with other people. But folks, you can't just make a decision and hope it's going to stick for two weeks. This variant is moving hour by hour, day by day. So we have to move with it and be nimble and be quick. And that, that's what we're doing. I, I wish, Rob, I could say, hey, guys, we're doing this and, and we'll be okay in three weeks. That's happened before. And it just seems as soon as we get it, another variant, the Brazilian comes in, the, the UK variant comes in, and uh, it changes the whole game. But I, I hear you, Rob. Uh, we're going to be very clear uh, tomorrow on what, what we're hearing from our chief medical officer to secure, secure areas. I, I would note uh, on the you know, cases and deaths and hospitalizations, people in ICU, we know cases are up, hospitalizations, the ICU admissions are up. 
according to the global news website, which which tracks the number of people dying from COVID-19 all across the country, that is now up. It had been declining for weeks. And now it's reversed. It's up 5% in the last two weeks. Number of people dying. I find that to be a troubling sign we, because we have vaccines and we have residents in, in long-term care fully vaccinated. Most people over the age of 90, over the age of 80, a lot of people in their 70s, they've been given at least one dose of vaccine. So to see that trend reverse itself is not encouraging at all. And as I mentioned, the situation with the Queensway Carlton, you um, canceling the non-urgent elective surgeries for the next four weeks, you see how the situation in ICU ripples throughout the healthcare spectrum. And imagine you're waiting, um, gosh, what's the wait time to get a new knee? A year <laughs> from start to finish. Sorry, you have to wait... Uh, your surgery's been cancelled. It's very frustrating. Uh, Tony in Canada. Good morning, Tony. You're on City News. Good morning, Rob. Yeah. I work in retail management and for a big box store, and I welcome this decision 100%. Okay. I have seen over the past year with partial lockdowns, with the stay-at-home orders, uh, our store will be closed and curbside only. But th- when we've had, uh, for the last two weeks, for example, our sales have gone up astronomically. People are coming into the store with all our protocol in place. They are still not recognizing social distancing. And I think the core problem for some of this is that the general public just doesn't really give a damn. They need to go out. They bring in four or five kids with them. They go shopping. They're browsing. They're not looking for essentials. So from a safety point of view and to protect my staff, I welcome this 100%. I have heard this, that uh, going to... um Big box retailer, you know, pick it. Is it Ikea? Is it Michael's? Is it whatever? Um, it's like a day out for some families. It is. Yeah. And I'm not well, we can't go to the, that. we're not going to the movies. Let's uh, let's go to Walmart and see what's... Let's go to uh, Walmart or let's go to Canadian let's Tire. Let's go to Canadian let's, Tire, let's, yeah. Let's do something and just get out. And I'm watching this. I'm managing lines and I'm seeing people, a family of four coming out with something that's worth $10. Right. So, you know, yeah. I welcome this 100%. I want to touch base on the travel restrictions and the curfew and the reasoning for not doing it because it's too hard to enforce. However, if you implement it, I think the deterrent should be enough for people to think, well, if I do go out or mm-hmm. if I stay past this time, there could be repercussions for that. So I think it's kind of a kind of a cheap way of saying, no, we can't do it because we can't enforce it. The deterrent will help enforce it. I see. Okay. The fact that the, 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 the just the threat of it being enforced would act as a deterrent enough, you think? I, right. I would yeah. think it would yeah, have yeah, to yeah. be that way. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. Um, I mean, for example, we took a call from uh, somebody who called the other day who was in Spain during the first lockdown, uh, and he said uh, in Spain it was... You know, they were checking your driver's license and your address on your driver's license, and the police officer was determining, okay, you're like you're you're a long way from home. You're not even supposed to be in this part of <laughs> what exactly. of town and, and, or whatever, and, right? You were only allowed so far away from your house. Now, exactly. You know, now I don't know. I mean, the, uh, the variant being spread. Well, it's already in our province, in our country. Now it's going to start spreading and has spread to our communities. Well restricting travel is that not one logical mm, okay way to do it right okay all right i'll leave that there i'll leave that with people thank you for your call right, Rob, tony you. yeah yeah uh pete claire jen hang on the line be right back with the final quarter free line there for you seven five oh thirteen ten as the clock counts down to midnight and the next stay at home order this is the rob snow show on city news Well, we all loved our rock t-shirts growing up, right? It was our badge that, hey, we went to this concert. We knew that band inside out. So we, we kept doing that and kept promoting that. What's, what's sort of happening now is that audience is dying. <laughs> I always say the earth is flat. <laughs> so the 60s rockers are falling off the end of the earth. So you don't see as big a sales anymore because my audience is disappearing. What's sort of helping uh, to promote that history is the kids are buying vinyl. 
and luckily we have a vinyl shop in the neighborhood here, uh, record center. So what's happening is I've seen kids come in with their dad and the dad say, hey, do you have any Beatles shirts? Do you have any CBGB? Do you have any of this? I said, well, why? Uh, you know, he said, well, because my daughter's into it. She's wearing my T-shirt. So slowly it's coming back, right? The kids are, I think, getting fed up with the generic music that's out there. And they want to click into something that, first of all, links them to their parents, something that they uh, thoroughly enjoy now, and maybe they're passing it on to their grandkids. Pandemic has been a couple of things, definitely hard on everybody. So much uh, uh, messaging that's out there that people don't understand, stats that every day, Jesus Murphy, like I'm getting a headache just reading this stuff, right? So, so really it was just trying to understand where we were going to go from there. The city of Ottawa all of a sudden said, everybody's got to wear a mask. You got to wear it on the bus. People were scrambling, okay? And I had, uh, the store next door had really big windows, so I just flooded the window with masks. Well, that was the, the activity that saved the business. Uh, people were coming in buying two, three, four masks at a time at 20 bucks a pop here. <laughs> but my masks were so different. They were the Rolling Stones, Beatles, Queen, all the pop culture. Everything else out there was medical masks. <laughs> and right, so people said, oh, I don't want to do that. I want to, I want to show my rock and roll. So it became the new, the new T-shirt as far as I'm concerned. Well, what I've done, I'm Hintonburg. I'm at, now at uh, 1114A Wellington Street, which is next door to the Fab Gear store. <laughs> And the reason I've changed names, I've rebranded the store, is because I was planning on retiring. And, and in December, I went, oh, I'm not going to retire. But I've committed to changing what the store is about. So I came up with a new name, Fab Gears Rock Shop, where legends are dressed. <laughs> and essentially get that message out. I prefer, if the shirt don't fit, you come in, you try another one on. People like to feel the fabrics with clothing. It's amazing. You all come in and go, Oh, I love that. Oh, can I try this? So that's the big difference. I'm not out to make a gazillion dollars. I stick the way I am, old school. I take cash, we take cards. Come on in and talk to the owner. Have your say and call now. 613-750-1310. What well, started as calls for action last week, Monday, Tuesday, Coming into focus here on Wednesday and will be a reality on Thursday. Uh, Premier Ford will break the news sometime this afternoon around 2 o'clock. Stay-at-home order, a state of emergency. 750-1310 here on the Talk Back Hour. Uh, Jen, Ottawa, what do you think, Jen? Hi. Hi. I think um, people have to stop blaming those who have gotten sick, first of all, because it's not necessarily their fault. They don't know how they've got it. I've I don't think anybody's it. blaming anyone for getting sick. Well, one of your previous callers was questioning who were the ones that got sick, um, right. kind of implicating like they did something wrong. But okay. yep. I work for um, the LCBO, and... 93% of us are considered casual, and that means we have no sick days. So I think sick days reinstated would be a big factor in helping to alleviate a lot of the spread because okay. the people who have to go to work cannot take time off. And even when coworkers test positive, they don't shut down the store. The other people don't go get tested because they can't afford to take the time off. Right, right, right. So maybe they go to work sick. Maybe they spread it around the store too, right? Yeah. Exactly. Absolutely. But they also don't notify the public. We right. see thousands of okay. people every week. We yeah. work seven days a week. Sure. Yeah, you good know, point. Good point. Are yeah. Shopping there for social outings. Yeah. Completely. Yeah. Yeah. Paid sick days. Still no sign of anything from the Ford government on um, on no. paid sick days. And they throw but, it back yeah. to the uh, federal government saying well, use their program. But sure. in order to use that program, you have to miss more than 50 percent of your week, which you can't do and keep your job. Okay. And that, I'm sure, goes across the board to anybody working in any kind of Yeah, it, it still is kind of remarkable that, uh, you know, the, the the Liberals come up with a paid sick day program. It's totally inadequate, and Doug Ford gets all the blame for it. Well, Doug Takes Ford too slow, to doesn't pay days. enough. Uh, yeah, it's all Doug Ford's fault. No, but <laughs> Doug Ford took away the sick days that were in place. Uh, there were only two difference. sick days. There were only two sick days anyway under that old I know, regime. but that would still make okay. a difference if you had okay. to make a choice whether or not to go get tested or to go to work. 
Yeah. Okay. And also the communications around the vaccines are sorely lacking because I see people all the time who come in thinking that now that they've been vaccinated and they don't need to wear a mask or they don't need to social distance and yet they just got their vaccine that same day mm. and don't seem to have an understanding that it takes weeks to actually build you know, up your immunity. Take effect. Yeah. Oh, really? Okay. Okay. I haven't noticed anything like that. So, okay. I haven't noticed anything like that, Jen. I haven't noticed anything like that. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for waiting. Thank you for calling. Thank you. Move along here. Uh, Claire in Ottawa. Claire. Hi. Um, Hi. I am so relieved that we're finally going into lockdown. I feel like we're overdue. Okay. Um, And why are you relieved? Why does it make you feel relieved? I feel like, well, most people are like dreading it. Going up a lot, a lot longer. And I mean, it was driving me crazy seeing so many people outside in like parking lot, lots, um, passing each other on sidewalks, not wearing masks, as though an airborne disease is can't be spread outside. And you know, because of that, like they're making it unsafe for me to go outside and people who want to stay safe. And then I feel like it's like no surprise that now nobody can go outside. So people, you know are like selfish and are like, well, I need to get out and get exercise, but now none of us can do it. Just for single minded thinking is like the bigger picture. Well, I think it's, you know, with the stay at home order, it's not that you can't go outside. It's, you know, the big thing is congregating indoors. They don't want groups of people indoors is what they don't. Yeah. When I talked to Dr. Vera Etches yesterday, she stressed the importance of actually getting outside, getting fresh air, but you have to maintain the two meter distance. That's that. That is her yeah. big thing. Wear your mask. And, maintain and your two meter distance. Yeah, just right. wear a yeah. mask. It's so yeah, wear a mask. Simple. Yeah, sure. Yeah. yeah, and and I'm also I'm sick of hearing people say that lockdowns don't work because they only reduce the numbers rather than eliminate them, as though that's like a, a reason not to do them when that's the only thing that'll work and it's opening back up that we should maybe well i think we want fewer incidents of illness fewer incidents of illness will mean fewer incidents of serious illness will mean fewer incidents of uh, of death will provide can you imagine what it must be like to be a nurse in a hospital right now i I can't i can't i can't to be a doctor in an icu unit right now what was what must must that be like what's the burnout like yeah Right. It's infuriating for them to hear people say, let's try something new. We, we're, you know, let's not do this. Let's right. try something new. But this is all we have. So, like, at least it's something. All at right. Least so you're, you're, you, you're saying it's about time and you're glad that it's happening. Yep. All right. Okay, Claire. Thank you. Thank Thanks. you. Yep. Sharon in Bell's Corners. Good morning, Sharon. Hi. Yep. Well, I'm not really for going into a lockdown. I'm damn mad about it. You are. And just think back. Where would you be going anyway? Well, I mean, <laughs> it isn't the fact that where you're going to go. It's that you can't go anywhere. It's like anything else. Once you have something taken away from you, yeah. it's, you know, it makes you very annoyed. But, the, you know, this whole problem started and ends with Trudeau. We wouldn't be in this situation if he hadn't been sucking up to China and wanting to get vaccines from then and got off his backside and ordered vaccines right at the beginning like everybody else. So when everybody, I'm mad at Doug Ford by times too, and the different medical officers of health, but let's not lose sight of the fact the problem started and ends with Trudeau. And when he comes out yesterday and, oh, we're, you know, we're offering the provinces help while slamming them because, of course, they just had these doses delivered and they haven't, they haven't been injected yet. But he doesn't play politics. Yeah, right. And his name's not, not Trudeau. But that's who I'm mad at and that's who I'm going to stay mad at. If we had had vaccines, we wouldn't be in this situation, I don't believe. And I don't believe either that people don't understand. If people don't understand that you're not, that it takes a while for the vaccine to take effect and so forth, well, what planet are they living on? They're telling everybody, right. you know, about that. So it's, it's just not true. People have to smarten up. The good thing about this coming lockdown, as far as I'm concerned, is that Walmart and Costco 
are only going to be allowed to sell food and drugs because they have made it like gangbusters in the last year. Yes. Everybody has been And we've there. seen the pictures of the lineups That's and right. the story, heard the stories of the lineups. That and a lady there. wrote into the Citizen today saying she hasn't been able to have Easter for two years with her family That's if she'd right. only known. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If you she'd know, only known, she would have met, met them at Ikea. Yeah. That's and, a great actual. And yeah. isn't that the truth? I mean, yes, it's, it is, it's yeah. sort of tongue in cheek, but yeah. it's it's true. Yeah, that's but, a good But, you know, there's the one thing, actually. certainly, you know, Doug Ford hasn't done everything right, and I've been mad at him for, as far as I'm concerned, being too nice to Trudeau when, you know, when he should be slamming him. But he should not either. I understand he gave in. There's going to be 6,000 teachers vaccinated when, because, of course, the teachers' unions have been all over them, when they claim, even Dr. Williams, who, you know, we questioned him sometimes, he says the school's you know, are are safe. But if the food processing plants and the big warehouses, if they're claiming now they're acknowledging that that's the problem, those 6,000 doses that the teachers are taking should be given to the people, you know, where the problem is. Not giving in to lobbying. I'm sure they're getting pulled every oh, yeah. which way. Yeah, yeah, but, on, yeah. you know, I'm, I'm really tired of it. I, I have my, my first shot. My husband and I got that, you know, week, week before last. Uh, I'm, I'm not happy that I have to wait four months to get the second one because who knows? Once again, that had to be done because Trudeau didn't get vaccines. So I can be as mad as I want about, you know, about Doug Ford and Dr. Williams and, and people not following the rules. We're all sick of it. My eyes are on, on Trudeau. That's the problem, and that's what we need to keep in our mind. Don't lose sight of it's the liberals that caused this. If they would have stopped the flights coming in to Canada in the beginning, if they would have acknowledged we had a problem, if they wouldn't have given away our PPE, if they would, would have ordered vaccines, yeah. it goes I on and on. Gotcha. Totally inept. I hear you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Loud and clear. And the last call for today's Talk Back Hour. Do that again tomorrow between 10 and 11 o'clock. Coming up right after the news at 11. Valley View with Bruce McIntyre from the Eganville Leader on the Rob Snow Show on City News. in Ottawa and the Valley. This is City News, now on 101.1 FM and 1310 AM. 
It's Wednesday, April 7th. Good morning. I'm Andrew Boyle. Right now in Ottawa, 12 degrees, 13 in Smith Falls. And here's what's making news in Ottawa and the Valley. Premier Doug Ford set to issue the stay-at-home order for Ontario, trying to control the third wave of this pandemic. The announcement coming at 2, the order taking effect at midnight tonight. With case counts topping 3,000 per day and more than 500 COVID patients in intensive care, Premier Doug Ford's been under pressure to impose tighter restrictions. Sources say the order Ford will announce this afternoon will take effect just after midnight and last for four weeks. After scenes of crowds packing shopping malls over the weekend, the order will make it clear that only stores selling essential goods are to remain open. Don Kelly, The Canadian Press, Toronto. Now the latest numbers from the province on new infections show an additional 3,215 cases and 17 more deaths province-wide. Ottawa has 225 new cases of COVID today. Eastern Ontario Health Unit with 32, 12 in Leeds, Grenville, Lanark. No new cases in Renfrew. The hardest hit area once again, Toronto, 1,095 new cases. Leeds, Grenville, Lanark Health Unit says there is a significant increase in COVID cases in its area close to Ottawa. 41 recent cases detected in the United Counties of Leeds, Leeds and Grenville East. 33 new cases in Lanark East, that's since March 28th. Greatest increase, Kempville and Carlton Place. Health Unit says an increasing number of infections are the variant B117 first detected in Britain. It's urging people to follow public health guidelines. The age to book a COVID-19 vaccine through the province's portal drops to 60. That started at 8 this morning. City News reporter Jamie Pulfer now with the latest on that rollout. As the vaccine supply increases, the age of eligibility for those shots continues to drop in the province. It means anyone 60 years and older can now book an appointment through the Ontario online portal. You can see the age adjustments on the website. The government has also released a list of postal codes where vaccines will be available to those 50 and over in hotspot communities, including many in the GTA. I'm Jamie Pulfer. Now, the vaccines for 50 and over are in 21 designated areas in Ottawa. Full list at ottawa.citynews.ca. Now, the National Vaccine Task Force is also out this morning with a reiterated guidance. It is okay to have the time between first and second doses at four months. A city councillor is calling for change to how transit works in rural parts of the city. Matt Luloff of Orleans says it would be beneficial if there were more bus routes from areas like Clarence Rockland that travel directly to an LRT station hub. So instead of having people sitting on a bus in traffic blowing off diesel on the 174 and also jamming it up for, for everybody from my community, what the bus would do is come in from Clarence Rockland, drop you off at Trim Station, which is the terminus for Stage 2. You could get off and then not sit in traffic, hop on the, hop on the train and be downtown a heck of a lot quicker. He says that would be a great idea in the west and south ends as well as people start moving further from work. He tells City News he'd also like to see more parking added to the future station at Trim Road. I'm Andrew Boyle for News Anytime. Follow up online at ottawa.citynews.ca. The world is changing. So keep up with Rob. The Rob Snow Show returns on Rogers TV and City News. 1011 FM and 1310 AM. Eve, I, Eve, I, oh, the best man in Ottawa was Maharajo. Maharajo. Ahead of the stay-at-home order and the state of emergency, Bruce McIntyre from the Eganville Leader here with Valley View. Good morning. Good morning, Rob. It's been a busy morning for me, I'll tell you. It has. Already. What have you been up to? Well, I scooted to Iron Prior to take my daughter to a day camp, which will be cancelled as of today. Okay. Right. 
And then I came back to no frills. And it was 8 o'clock in the morning, Rob. Actually, it's 10 to 8. I was able to buy my one cider. And you buy cider at 7 o'clock in the morning, but you can't drink after 8 o'clock at night some places. I don't know. <laughs> no no and, frills, uh, Mike's. Holy <laughs> cow. You are like the classiest guy I know. <laughs> 7 o'clock in the morning buying cider at no frills. That's I know. Weird. Bruce. As I said, I said, this is for the, for the afternoon. Was it like a it's king can? Was it a king can, Bruce, or what? It was a, it was a, uh, <laughs> a tall boy. <laughs> No, it was not tall boys. One one can of cider. I'll have it tonight. <laughs> okay. Oh, uh, so that legal, was uh, just uh, just listening to gossip on the street, and uh, yeah. people are despondent right now. Rob. Yeah, little, yeah. There's a, a bit of that. There's a bit of that. So there's, there's some anger. Some hey, some people are saying it's about time. They should have done this long ago, right? So well, we've been doing it here in the valley, but uh, frustration is bubbling up. So I'm curious yeah. to see what's going to happen after Thursday. Well, well you know, I wonder how it's going over with this sort of um, one size fits all approach, right? You have no uh, cases reported. No, well, yeah, today, two days in a so. row. Um, but you know what? It doesn't stop people from traveling. I mean, uh, last weekend I was down in Murphy's Garage in Renfrew, chatted with the owner, Dave Murphy, and we just watched all the license plates go by with the Oshawa border stickers around the license plates and Toronto oh, really? and Ottawa. It's like, here they come again. Yeah, yeah, okay. So much about um, to stay at home. You know, I wanted to follow up. We did a, an interview this morning with Councillor Matt Luloff, who's from the East End, and he's talking, again, this is a, a kind of a long-time complaint from East End City Councillors that people come in from Clarence Rockland, they come in from Wendover and and these kinds of places and they're clogging up the 174 and uh, they're causing, you know, traffic jams. They're using our roads and not paying our taxes. And you could say the same thing, I suppose, about commuters who who are coming into Ottawa from Renfrew. They work in Ottawa, they live in Renfrew, right? Um, So he would like to see... Uh, in the East End, it's called um, Le Duc, bus lines. C- say, come in to run a bus from Clarence Rockland to Trim Road, where there's a, a park and ride and a light rail station. Get off there and you take the light rail into town. Instead of having, say, a, a motor coach sit on the 174 with 40 passengers on it or whatever. Yeah. I was wondering, Bruce, you know, just in your experience, because you used to do a daily commute, Renfrew to Ottawa. You worked on Parliament Hill, right? Yeah. Yep. Back and forth every day. That was your daily yeah. commute. Um, was there, is there um, like a commuter bus service that goes from Renfrew to Ottawa, like on a daily basis? Is there such a service that would make, say, one or two runs in the morning and then a run home in the afternoon kind of thing? or? There was, when I first moved here, a gentleman had a bus, an old uh, restored school bus, and they all of them worked at the Mitel plant in Canada. Oh, okay. And I was able to jump, a couple of us who didn't work there jumped on that bus, and he let us off at the Eagleson Park and Ride. Now, Rob, it's funny you should mention that about 10 years ago, they tried to get a railway going, uh, a rail right. line strictly uh, for this purpose, both as sort of the Wakefield model, yep. Uh, yep. that nice little choo-choo, but also to get commuters going. But then uh, something happened. They went toward all the rail lines. So That's right. There's no rail. Yeah, you couldn't do it by rail now, no, right? No, you can't do it by rail. But as yeah. far as bus service goes, no, there isn't. You'll see a lot of people, not a lot of people, some people do put ads on Facebook or in the newspaper looking for a ride. They'll have a, four or five people in a vehicle. Uh, that is the way people go now. Or they just drive by themselves, and they just drive right in. But uh, it's no, there is no uh, I, Do you think if they're... You know, and I guess maybe it's kind of a stupid question because if it would be used, maybe it'd somebody be doing it already. But um, yeah. I just wonder because we've, you know, we've talked a lot about the exodus, right? Um, people who've left the city for the for country living, small town living, life in yeah. the valley, Bruce. Um, I wonder how many wonder. How, how many of those people would 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 actually say if there was say some kind of. I, it wouldn't be a go train, but maybe a go bus kind of thing. If that kind of service actually existed, say, coming in from Renfrew, Armprior, those valley communities, it's, into, it's, into I, the city, I wonder if people would actually take it or would it be a total waste of I think time? if there was a business model, it would have been done by now. Yeah. Um, maybe there would be a business model next year once the highway, or the next 10 years, once the highway to twinning is completed. But right now, I don't think there's a business model for it. Enough of a 
uh, people that want to do that. A lot of people like, like to drive their cars, Rob. That's the thing. They like their cars. They like the independence. They like to, you know, blow their nose in privacy. They like to sure. drink their coffee. And Plus, maybe even, you know, after a year of an infectious disease pandemic, not a lot of people clamoring to share That's the true. ride anymore, right? That's we, true. You know, we're certainly yeah. seeing that with just plain old OC transport. And we're I do wonder, because you used to speak, Bruce, about, you know, what that commute was like. Right, six o'clock in the morning, bumper to bumper, all the way from Renfrew, right? Yeah, yeah. If I didn't get, if I, I left Renfrew at a certain time, if I didn't get to the uh, Bayshore by ten to seven. I was stuck. I I'd be stuck taking there. another forty minutes to get downtown. Another. 40 um, it was not a fun time, so I would leave early, early, and there's a you see the tail, the trail, tail, tail lights behind me as well, following the same thing. It had to be at a certain time, yeah. and that's just good weather and good driving. Yeah, yeah, yeah. When you have an I wonder what that drive is like now. I don't. I haven't done it for a long time because I go yeah. when it's not busy. I leave here at nine thirty in the morning or something. So right, right, right. Bad. Okay. And so, I heard you and the good professor talking about the housing market. Just a quick little antidote. We have the same thing happening here. A uh, young couple I know have a, we're renting a home in uh, Eganville, and the house they got a little notion there from the landlord that he sold the property, and they got two months to find a place to live. And that oh. is happening more and more. You'll see it on, I've heard uh, my better half, Trish, is telling me about a woman that she says, I'm homeless May 1st. I'll pay anything to get myself and two kids in because my building was sold. So we're seeing that spin-off effect. Not only are buyers and sellers trying to find a place to live, so are the renters. Eganville leader is out today. Papers available for sale. Best two bucks you'll ever spend. Very colorful. Okay. Independently owned since 1902, Renfrew County's largest paid circulation newspaper. Big story this morning and the front page story this week, changes made to official plan. Yes. What's going on? Goodness. Renfrew's well, official our, plan, the county of Renfrew's official plan. We call her the Iron Lady for a reason. Janice TJ uh, from Killu Hagrid Richards. She's been a member of county council and the head of their council since the late 80s, I believe. And she, when she gets the mindset to something, she goes after it. And she was adamant. She drew a line in the sand. I am not, and my residents will not uh, agree to this official plan. Basically, what they wanted to do was make any type of severance within a uh, kilometer outside the village of Killaloo um, non-existent. Same with any urban center. They wanted to have almost 80% of the Renfrew County designated as a deer yard. Uh, basically a sanctuary for Bambi and all the like. And we don't. There's, there's no shortage of Bambis, Rob. We have a deer overpopulation here. It's not a question of preserving them. It's a question of getting, getting them out of the cornfields. So the official plan was brought forward to the county council members, and they rejected it, and they told the county council, the development of property and the planning crew, get back and do what we told you to do, please. This is not what we requested. And they're kind of in a bind. The planning department says, well, this is the province tells us what to do. This is the regulations we have to follow. And the county councillor said, too bad. So luckily, after some rejigging, the official plan was made. And you have a group of very happy heads of council who go back to the residents and tell them you're safe in the deer sanctuary from now. You're safe. All those stones in that field that you can barely drive a tractor through is no longer designated prime agricultural land. Um, the, just the absurdity of the, some of the conditions put in there, basically what it's doing is stifling growth. It was basically saying, Renfrew County, you cannot grow, you cannot develop. And so it has now been reversed, and you have a very large group of happy councillors now. Okay. It's just a move from downtown Toronto. It's a bureaucrat right. in Toronto saying, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. So we're happy about that. Okay. All right. Okay. Uh, strange as it might be, uh, there are workers on strike. This, this day and age, I know, Haley right. Industries. That's Haley about, Industries, uh, yeah, yeah. Magellan Aerospace, right? Yeah. Yep, yeah. about 10 kilometers outside of Renfrew. And the employees, this is the first strike in about 10 years, and they're not asking for a lot. Uh, and people will say, well, they'd be happy to have a job. Well, yes, they have a job, but they're also a unionized environment, and under, under collective bargaining, you have the option to strike if the uh, employer doesn't, you don't come to terms. And so they're not asking for a lot. Uh, paid holidays. Um, there's 350 employees, and I'm not sure how long this will go on. It's hard to say. Uh, the company may want to wait them out, but they are they are determined an essential service. They make uh, airplane parts, ironically, which airplanes aren't flying. But uh, it used to be a very one of the, it was the richest site in the world for magnesium. 
out there uh, years ago. And that's why Haley Industries was uh, made there shortly during after the World War II. And the employees were on strike. And another thing they want, the, the employer wants to bring in a third shift on weekends. And they're saying, listen, we don't have a third shift during the week. Why do we want to come in weekends when you can make it during the week? Ah, I so see. Okay. they're a little frustrated okay. because they did receive a lot of money from the emergency wage subsidy. And they said that didn't really trickle down to the employees. So now the employer... It's, I haven't really heard much about it, but they're saying they're still negotiating. They're still willing to go, but you have 350 people on strike right now. Hmm. That's a big chunk of the population. Okay. That's one of our biggest industrial uh, manufacturing plants. Yeah, yeah. I, I, you have 350 people on strike at a manufacturing plant, right? Yeah. Uh, it's a big, big news story. So yeah. uh, $2 million investment in recreation trail polarizing counselors. The Algonquin Trail. What is that? Uh, so that is a trail that runs from North Bay through to Renfrew County, all the way down to Lanark. It's 300 kilometers of trail that used to be the C and uh, CP rail line that was torn up. Oh, I see. So okay. they decided 10 years ago to make that into a recreational trail to attract tourists, to attract ATVers, skidoers, you know, um, skiers, everything else. Right. So they wanted to spend an extra $2 million to finish the trail as far as laying down the dusting and the, to get, make it usable. Because basically when you come to Renfrew, it stops. You oh, can't okay. really use the rest of it for motorized vehicles. Right. You have some of the counselors who want it and some of them who don't, and they had a very heated dis- discussion. Basically, the ones who don't say, listen, this is not the time to spend $2 million on a, on a recreation trail. Um, we have other priorities going on as well. We were told when this brought in that there would not be a levy on the trail, and yet now here we go. We're going back to the taxpayers asking them for money. We were told that it would be all grants and investments, and there wouldn't be tax dollars involved. And those in favor of it say, listen, this is the future of economic development. They, they point to the Bruce Trails down in southern Ontario as an example. So it ended up passing in a weighted vote. Um, in Unlike the city of Ottawa, where it's a simple majority, mm-hmm. here each vote is weighted. So, for example, Renfrew would have, say, hypothetically 11 a score of 11, whereas Killaloo would have a score of four because it's based on population. So the weighted vote was taken and the $2 million was invested. And oh, some of the counselors were not happy. It was, a, it was a close. It was a close vote. Okay. All right. Thanks for the update. Hey, no problem. It's, uh, what it's else like do you have to do? What else do I have to do? That's right. I, I was talking to David. I think David <laughs> should take up gardening. He's cranky. He's a pick up gardening. Go to garden center. David will be fine. Uh, he's going golfing when this weekend, I think, right? You're going golfing? If I'm allowed. If he's allowed. I might close Come up it. here, Dave. We'll, we'll take you, David. We'll take you. Lots All of golf right. courses. Okay. Talk soon. Thanks, Bruce. Thanks, Rob. Bye-bye. From the Eganville leader uh, in Renford today, Bruce McIntyre. Be right back. Rob Snow Show, City News. Part of the reason I got back back into this is because um, I am creative and I also wanted to kind of have a fun flair, 50s vibe. All of the boxes are kind of fun names. The colors are fun. The logo is fun. And it, it's not just the package that I want to bring joy to people's lives. It's also the feeling that they get when they receive it to know that there's someone that thinks of them and they're missing them and showing that they care when they can't be there. The smallest of the subscription boxes is the red box, the classical box. So you would get five to seven items from the variety of categories. Those do change quarterly. However, with items that are more popular, we'll bring them back as people ask for them or you could get them as an add-on option. And then those items will be included in the jazzy box, the same items from the first, although they'll be in a larger size, more quantity, as well as a couple extra items. And then in the largest box, the Duop Deluxe, which is our most popular, that is a comprehensive offering of all of the other two boxes plus additional. So for example, if you were to get a certain item in the smallest of the boxes, that item would still be offered in the large, but in a, in a bigger size. So you're getting everything bigger plus an extra few items. The first thing is I look for Canadian suppliers and manufacturers. That is something I'm very proud of. I make sure that the products are safe, um, that they fit into the packages that we offer, obviously. They have to be the proper size and weight. Um, I have approximately 300 items that we have so far that we can order that basically help um, make people's lives easier. There's snacks, there's self-care items, there's entertainment, a little bit of everything. And basically I try it and test it and if it's duly approved, then I include it in our packages.
So some of the categories that we have is we offer treats, which is of course everyone likes treats no matter how old you are. So we have things like nuts, uh, chocolates, different types of snacks, maybe a handmade piece of jewelry. We also include pieces of jewelry as well, occasionally. Uh, we also have our pamper items. So your pamper items would include things like your bath soaks, your uh, specialty uh, lotions, things like that. Two other categories we offer are leisure. Leisure would include things such as puzzles, adult coloring books, paint by numbers, crosswords, word find, Sudoku, if that's how you say it. Um, and we also have items for self-care and health. So masks, sanitizers, sanitizing wipes. They're all natural, non-drying, made with natural ingredients. So they're very, um, they're very good for everyone, especially in this time that we're dealing with. Firm. Fair. Fun. The Rob Snow Show returns on Rogers TV and City News, 1011 FM and 1310 AM. COVID in the schools. COVID in the schools. So we're going to play a clip here. Dr. Vera Etches again was on my show yesterday. Yesterday morning, and I asked her, is COVID spreading classrooms? What is known? And she said, They've studied it. They've studied the variants of concern, and she's, she's felt confident that the school is a safe environment for children. Children are more likely to get COVID in the community than in the schools, and the same for teachers. The, the community transmission is what is driving COVID levels up, and it's what's introducing COVID into schools. So the schools are not the place where children are typically picking up COVID. Classrooms are not a driver of transmission. Is that what you're saying? That's correct. Uh, you know, of all the people that test positive, when we send the cohort home, um, usually we do, do not see transmission within that cohort. And we've studied that for variants of concern as well. We've asked uh, everyone to be tested when they've gone home and there's a variant of concern at play. And we did not find uh, that there was greater transmission in those situations. Okay, so that's Dr. Vera Etches on her take on what's happening with, with public education and COVID-19. Nevertheless, we have seen medical officers of health order the closing of schools in both Toronto and Peel. So Mark Fisher is with me now, Ottawa Carleton District School Board trustee for Zone 11, uh, River, Gloucester, Southgate, uh, good morning, Mr. Fisher. Nice to be with you. Yeah, nice to be nice to be with you. What kind of discussions are happening at the board level right now on whether to keep in school learning going or not? Well, you know, as you indicated, uh, you know, we were very fortunate to have Dr. Etches uh, appear before the school board last night, and she gave a very thoughtful, detailed presentation about what's happening in our city and sort of her her view as a public health expert in terms of uh, COVID-19 in the city and sort of where we stand with the variants. And there's really sort of two things that jumped out at me. Uh, number one is, is that the pandemic has changed um, um, and the virus that we've known for the last 12 months, you know, while still present in some way, has really been taken over by the new variants and particularly the, the UK variant. And, and obviously that's concerning because, you know, data from across Canada, from across North America is shows that uh, younger people are particularly getting infected um, and, and ending up in hospital um, and is potentially more contagious. Um, so obviously that's concerning as we see those rates grow. And she's absolutely right that we're seeing, uh, you know, too too many, you know, sort of cases show up in our in our communities, particularly, you know, my area, K1V, K1T, which is South Ottawa, which has been identified as hotspots by the uh, by the province of Ontario. Okay. So so on that level, that's that's very concerning. And and as she indicated last night, the more that cases go up in our community, the more cases can find their way into our schools. She's absolutely right that schools aren't necessarily a place where transmission occurs, but nonetheless, um, as communities community cases go up, cases do show up in our schools and kids are, are sent home. Um, my daughter Fiona, just as an example, has been sent home three times. She's had five tests. We get uh, letters almost daily. Um, and so when I look your, at that- Your as daughter's parent, been tested for COVID-19 five times? Correct. How old? Uh, she's 10. Wow. 
Holy cow. Okay. And so that's that's our community context, Rob, and and that's what really drove me to you know thinking about this as a parent, thinking about this as a trustee. You know, what can we do as we see the surge in cases as a school board? And right. I just felt that this week was a good week to perhaps go online, you know, use the the, the break next week as a sort of a, a two week um, uh, stopgap uh, safety valve, and and try and do our level best to try and get these cases down. But that has to be coupled with stricter measures by the province. And hopefully we're going to hear from the problems today that they're willing to put in place those stricter measures because. Right. Yeah, yeah. Well, certainly I think that's been well telegraphed in the premier yeah. as his news conference at two o'clock this afternoon. I think we all know what's coming, right? So, yeah. but at the school board level, what is being done given these very alarming increasing case counts? What's being done with school board funds, do, 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 you know, dedicating resources to actually more COVID safety in classes? Yeah, so I think when you look at the overall measures that we've been able to put in place, you know, thanks to provincial funding, I'll, I'll certainly give them, um, you know, an A-plus for, you know, providing school boards with the necessary funding and resources to really um, make our schools uh, safer this year. And I think the last 12 months has shown that we can operate schools safely when community cases uh, are very, very low. Um, and so we're quite confident that the measures are in place uh, can be effective. I think as we move into the warmer weather, there's more things that we can do, like perhaps Perhaps, you know, opening more doors and windows, you know, having kids learn outside. Um, these are all additional things that we can do to create an even safer uh, environment. Uh, but again, I have to stress that, um, you know, community cases have to be incredibly low in order to keep schools open safely. And um, that is, that's why I'm hopeful that the province will put in those stricter measures to make sure that uh, we can really drive these cases down. Um, and obviously we're going to have to reevaluate uh, at the end of the break to see where we are with, with cases and what does that mean for, for, for schools and back to school. Okay. Whose call is it in the end? It's not the school board's call. Um, we right. certainly have the authority under the Education Act to, uh, to close certain schools because of inclement weather and emergencies and, and uh, a few other, um, you know, a, a few other areas. But, you know, closing a system, um, you know, that's really the, the decision of Ottawa Public Health, um, as you've seen in other jurisdictions across the province. What if the situation goes from bad to worse, okay, even after the break? How ready is the school board, the Ottawa Carleton District School Board, to pivot and do the balance of the year online? Sure, and and Dr. Etch said last night that that is absolutely uh, an option. That's something that has to be on the table. Nobody likes that scenario. Everybody wants our kids in school. I'll be the first one to admit that as a parent. Yeah. Uh, but based on our experience over the last year, and again, my daughter Fiona's experience of having to come home three times at 14 days each, the shift has been remarkable. I think teachers have done a fantastic job to get a system, a virtual system up and running throughout the year. And every time my daughter Fiona has had to pivot to a home learning environment, it's been seamless. And so I'm quite confident that if we have to come out of the break and we need to be learning at home for a little bit longer, um, that we can do that effectively. I know that it's not ideal for a lot of families and particularly families that uh, are working two or three jobs or in precarious positions. Uh, nobody wants to be in this situation, but I know that the continuity of learning can, can continue you know, if we're forced into that situation coming out of the break. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Fisher. Thank nice you. to hear from you, sir. That is Mark Fisher. He is a school board trustee with the Ottawa Carleton District School Board. Sam Hammond is a teachers union president. He's with the Elementary Teachers Federation of Ontario, also known as ETFO. And he'll join me coming up after the news on the Rob Snow Show on City News.
number one for local news in Ottawa and the Valley. This is City News, now on 1011 FM and 1310 AM. It's Wednesday, the 7th of April. Good morning, I'm Sarah Buck, and right now in Ottawa and in Smith's Falls, lovely day. It's nice sunshine and 15 degrees. Here's what's making news right now. Ontario is going to issue a new stay-at-home order to try to control a third wave of the COVID-19 pandemic. That's expected this afternoon when Premier Doug Ford holds a news conference, which we will bring to you live. Uh, We're told the stay-at-home order will take effect just after midnight and last for four weeks. Only stores selling essential goods will be able to remain open during the four-week period. We'll have full details for you from that news conference this afternoon. Meantime, provincial health officials report 3,215 new cases of COVID-19 in Ontario and 17 more people have died. Hospitalizations are up just under 1,400 patients in hospital. 504 of them are in intensive care and 311 of those are on ventilators. Public Health Ontario sees 225 new cases of COVID-19 in Ottawa. Eastern Ontario, 32 new cases. The leeds grenville Lanark Health Unit is reporting 13 new cases in the past 24 hours. Renfrew County has no new cases. The health units update their numbers in the afternoon. After further research, the National Advisory Committee on Immunization is standing by its emergency recommendation to extend the period between COVID shots up to four months. The panel of experts still believes that will protect more Canadians more quickly. It's recommending no one get second doses until everyone has had access to a first shot. I'm Sarah Buckin for News Anytime. Follow up online at ottawa.citynews.ca. He's a pillar of community opinion. The Rob Snow Show returns on Rogers TV and City News. 1011 FM and 1310 AM. Sam Hammond is the president of the Elementary Teachers Federation of Ontario with me this morning on City News. Good morning. Hi, Rob. How are you? I'm good. How are you? I'm well, thank you. It appears as though uh, we're headed for stay-at-home orders to last for a month, uh, more more severe than what we have experienced in the last couple of months. What what is your reaction, just before we get to what's going on in the education system, what's your reaction to that uh, move by the Premier? Well, a stay-at-home order is uh, is great, okay. uh, but the problem with it is that it, there are so many people, uh, so many workers and families uh, who need who need paid sick days to be able to stay home uh, as per uh, that directive. So, you know, we have put out the call with so many others to encourage this government to ask this government um, to to provide paid sick days for workers uh, in, in Ontario. Okay. Okay. What happened just on paid sick days? Uh, and and you represent elementary teachers um, here in the province of Ontario. What what happens if an elementary teacher has to miss work? What happens there? They take a sick day. They, it's not a vacation day or whatever. How does that work anyway? You know? Well, it, it depends on the situation. If okay. they're sick, right. if they're sick, actually, uh, yes, they can access their sick leave uh, that they have. Right. Uh, if they, if they're being quarantined, uh, they don't have access to sick leave. They have to access other, uh, uh, go through other avenues. Okay. Uh, and if they're feeling unsafe that they uh, in reporting to work, then they actually need to take a leave of absence without pay. Right. Okay, so for example, uh, okay, I, I, I'm not sick or I don't have COVID-19, but my partner does or my spouse does or whatever the case might be. And I, for that reason, I can't be in a classroom for whatever, 14 days or what have you, right? You said they well, have you, other avenues, right? Well, or, you, you, no, you, you, you and I uh, agree on that, that right. if, uh, if I'm a teacher or an education worker or my spouse, someone in my family has COVID, uh, I should be staying home. I should be uh, sure. uh, not out in public. That's not the case. Uh, I would be, you would be, whomever's in that situation expected to report to work. I see. Okay. 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 That's interesting. The New York Times yeah. reports this morning, 80% of all school staff and child care workers in the United States, Mr. Hammond, 80%. I've had at least one dose of vaccine in the United yeah. States. Eighty percent. Okay. Um, what, what do you? What do you? I know it's probably just a guess on your part, but what do you figure is a comparable number here in Ontario? Yeah, nowhere near eighty percent. Nowhere near ten percent. No near. Nowhere near. 
five uh, percent. Wow, I wish uh, that, that's amazing, yeah. uh, and I wish that that kind of leadership uh, was here in Ontario, um, where uh, education workers and essential workers were being vaccinated or. Uh, a, a comprehensive plan to ensure that they're going to be vaccinated ASAP was in place. Yeah. When you say ASAP, what do you mean? I, I saw something, I thought I saw something that said by next week, by the end of next week or something. Well, want, yeah, right? We, right? yeah we, we, we have called, you know, uh, uh, the Premier said that we entered uh, uh, phase two of the vaccination rollout yesterday. Uh, we've been calling on uh, the government, uh, on uh, the Premier and the Minister of Education to as of today and throughout next week and thereafter um, to start vaccinating uh, education workers uh, and essential workers in this province. Right, right. And, and why, you know, make let's make the case for a teacher and why a teacher should be vaccinated. Why is that? A, why should that be a priority, Mr. Henry? Well, just, just to use that example, um, you know, we say here in Ontario that we're going to shut down businesses mm -hmm. uh, because of the concern of these new variants uh, and, and the spread of COVID-19 in, in those buildings. And that's all due to um, close proximity of people uh, and the sharing of that air and that space. Uh, you have teachers who are going into classroom with 30 or more students with no adequate uh, physical distancing. Uh, and that's, that's, a, that's a concern. And they're in those classrooms all day, every day, all week. Um, so it, it doesn't make sense that we're seeing in one case, uh, you know, we've got to, we are concerned about the safety and people uh, of people in those closed spaces, sharing that space for long periods of time, but we're not uh, for teachers. Okay. I'm going to play, I played this clip several times and I'm going to play it again. This was Dr. Vera Etches. Um, what what's happening in classrooms and are classrooms safe? Because there's you know there's been a lot of worry uh, because we see the rising case counts, we see the variants of concern, and all of these news stories, and people are worried. You know, is my child yeah. safe when they go to school? Is COVID being spread in a classroom setting, for example? She says no, uh, and she's the chief medical officer of health, Mr. Hammond. Okay. I didn't go to medical school. You didn't go to medical school, right? Yeah. So let we, these are the people we need to listen to. So let's listen. This is from yesterday morning, okay? Children are more likely to get COVID in the community than in the schools, and the same for teachers. The, the community transmission is what is driving COVID levels up, and it's what's introducing COVID into schools. So the schools are not the place where children are typically picking okay. up COVID. Classrooms are not a driver of transmission. Is that what you're saying? That's correct. Uh, you know, of all the people that test positive, when we send the cohort home, um, usually we do, do not see transmission within that cohort. And we've studied that for variants of concern as well. We've asked uh, everyone to be tested when they've gone home and there's a variant of concern at play. And we did not find uh, that there was greater transmission in those situations. Okay. So w what do you think about that? Well, you classrooms know, it, are safe, basically. Is what you said. Well, yeah, we we don't agree, uh, and uh, I, I say that based on what's happening, the reality on the ground. Uh, you know, yesterday we had in in schools, I think, close to 250 cases. Uh, in the last 14 days, something like 2,028 cases, uh, and other medical experts. And this is part of the problem. I mean, there's a you know. <clears throat> two sides or, or different opinions, but uh, medical experts that we referenced today have repeatedly said that schools are not simply reflections of community transmissions, but drivers of it as well, and that the variants are being transmitted uh, uh, by children now, uh, and, and that's the case. That's the case also in schools. But uh, you know, I, it's very interesting because this government has not implemented. Uh, a comprehensive on the ground asymptomatic testing plan like they said that they were going to. So I'm not sure how, um, you know, it, when there isn't uh, the, uh, the data to point to, solid data based on those tests, uh, how anyone can say that schools are safe when it's not based on actual data. Okay. Do you agree with the decision by the health authorities in Toronto and Peel to uh, you close know, those schools? Yeah, we, you know, we actually do. We, we, uh, yeah. There's no doubt, no question that the best learning environment for students 
and the best working conditions for our members are in cl- are in classrooms in person learning. But given the situation in these hotspots, Peel and Toronto, uh, you know, Ottawa, York, and others, uh, we actually are saying yes. Uh, and applaud the move that uh, those public health units have made uh, in saying we're going to take a cautious approach here. We're going to move to virtual learning. But second part of that is let's vaccinate uh, all of the uh, uh, workers within school buildings uh, and boards across the province. Okay. So, uh, yeah, I understand that. And how, with the downtime, with the break coming up, how, what would be the best use of that time? To shore Vac- things up, do you think? Vaccines would be one, right? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Vac- uh, start that process of vaccinating uh, all essential workers, including educators and education workers across this province. Uh, so very pleased to see that the Niagara Public Health Unit has opened up their vaccinations to uh, 4,000 education uh, workers uh, in that region. And it's that simple, and we can do that uh, across the province. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Hammond. Always nice to hear from you, sir. I really appreciate your time this morning. All the best. Yep. Uh, Sam Hammond is the head of FO Elementary Teachers Federation of Ontario. He's in Toronto today. It's 1142. Uh, Meeting of the Transportation Committee happening uh, with Ottawa City Hall today. That's a big thing on the City Hall agenda. We will get into that and other issues in city issues with Sue Sharing from the Ottawa Sun coming up next here on City News. Here at the Thirsty Maiden, uh, we offer a variety of products. Uh, So everything from breakfast items, so it's breakfast sandwiches and scones, which have become a staple item here at the cafe. We have an assortment of pastries and cakes and desserts. So we're really big on our dessert bar, which a lot of people come here for. And of course, our delicious coffee beverages. So we do offer uh, not your typical lattes, things like a chocolate banana coconut latte, cinnamon coconut, which is my favorite, and our take on even a pumpkin spice, which we add nutmeg and a dash of cayenne in just to give it a bit of a kick. When you start a business, um, you don't factor in all the things that could go wrong. You think anything that goes wrong, any failure, it's got to be something on your shoulders. You didn't market right, you're carrying the wrong products, you didn't price your items correctly, all the things, right? Um, But when this pandemic began, things going through my brain, where I didn't factor in a pandemic. Um, And we were just starting to grow. We were about to blow up, you know, and I think I spent two days crying. um, And then I shut my business down for, I think, a period of two or three days. And um, just being at home for those, during that time, I realized this is not me. I'm, anybody that knows me knows I'm a a hard worker. I don't give up and I'm a go-getter. And I started to think, well, I I should probably just start clearing out my freezers and posting and seeing who wants to buy what. And that was sort of how I built my momentum back up. I realized that there's still a large number of people that wanted to support us and were looking for the items that I had to provide. So we started there, then I reopened literally not even three or four days after I'd closed my doors and then started doing curbside pickups and deliveries, started doing the deliveries myself, free deliveries to the local community, going as far as Bell's Corners and CARP as well. And uh, that's why we're still here. This community has really kept us going a year into the pandemic. But we've had a change over staff a couple of times now and uh, you know, situations change and you know, when you can't offer hours and staffing, uh, sorry, hours for your employees, you don't blame them when they have to go elsewhere. So I think that's also been one of the challenges is recruiting, training, and then they leave, you know, and then bringing in more people and recruiting and anybody in this industry will, you know, will tell you that that's something we deal with on a regular basis, whether or not COVID's in the mix or not, but um, more so now, because every time there's a lockdown, there's a risk of Will we make it through? And then you lay off more staff. And again, their situations and their circumstances change.
Opinionated Ottawa icon. The Rob Snow Show returns on Rogers TV and City News. 1011 FM and 1310 AM. The big thing on the City Hall agenda today is a meeting of the Transportation Committee. Let's, uh, let's give it a little listen. I remember all this is um, actually Tim Tierney chairs this committee. Thought, why are we Councilor not building the hydro wires? Um, but yet, uh, I think everybody else except for Councilor Belay at the time and I were voted against it for various reasons. There was no approved money to bury those hydro wires. I think the tune was going to be about 11 million or something. It was quite a good ticket, but it was found at the end of the day. Uh, and was able to make it happen, which is a great improvement. But I, I think this, you know, I've heard these discussions. We, we did this for Elgin. We did this for Elgin. Well, we didn't do it for Elgin. We actually voted knowing the hydro wires were going to ma- remain above ground. And it was just luck that <laughs> they got buried. So David knows uh, a little bit more about this issue this than me because it's near where there. David lives. So uh, Councillor Menard wants some money set aside because they're going to do some work near Hawthorne. Right. Yeah, Hawthorne and, and Hawthorne Main Street and Greenboro, that sort of area there. Are, um, they're doing a revitalization project. They need right. to replace the sewers, widen the sidewalks, add bike lanes. It's a continuation of the work they were doing on Elgin. Right. Not okay. at that scale. They're yeah, not closing yeah, yeah, the road. Okay. But Menard wants them to find bury the hydro, to b- bury the hydro, bury the hydro, the hydro lines, which is going to cost another few million dollars. They don't All have right. this whole All thing. Right. It looks like it, it looks like Menard and Tierney are going at it here. Description and unfortunately, they can't share the screen because that's how Zoom bombing starts, and we're not going to do that today. Okay. Uh, okay. So. <laughs> uh, I don't know if someone else can, but I mean, I'm looking at the Hawthorne traditional Main Street. We're talking about uh, a fairly short block uh, where part of the hydro wires are going to be buried, and part of them are not very uh, close to to many businesses okay, so uh there we go that's what they're sparring about today on the on um, the, the city hall zoom call uh sue sharing are you following at all sue uh, with any interest i today? am yeah. in and out in and out in and out in and out uh, good to hear from you how are you how have you been everything's good you know covid uh covid stuff. still here <laughs> how will this stay at home order for the next month affect you sue not at all. Not at all. <laughs> I asked you that because I knew that's what you were <laughs> And I knew you knew. Yeah, no, I'm uh, I'm very careful. Yes, you As are. As a result, yeah. I, I'm a bit COVID crazy, but... Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, Sue texted me and said, uh, I'm uh, growing <laughs> a bit tired of it all, and I bet you yeah. are, but we all got to hang in there, right? Oh, I know. Right? Oh, I have, abs- uh, you know, and I, I feel guilty even saying that because I know that I have it much better than a lot of people who have, you know, other people they have to worry about and making that dreadful decision about whether sending your kids to school and yeah. what to do with elderly parents. I mean, there's a whole slew of things that don't uh, don't affect me in my uh, my little basement well, here. Well, yeah, but I, I was, you know, I do think about this and I, uh, you know, I've had these conversations uh, with Jen, you know, if your kids were school-aged again, uh, would you, you know, would you have any choice but to send them to school? And she said to me, I'd have to send them to school. I, have, I have, you know, I have to go work. I have to, I had, I, you know, I had to earn a living, right? So what choice did I have? You know, see, so much of just having school is, is, you know, it's, it's not negotiable. You know, school needs to be there or yes, but I mean, life I kind of falls apart for a lot of people, right? So, Depending on the age of your children and given that it's COVID, a lot of people are working from home. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, you might be able to, to make that work. And I, I'm not, obviously, my kids are... Yeah, but your <laughs> kids are grown, but, you know, back... I just You know, in the day when they were. decision, do I... You know, do I send them to school and fear all day what's going to happen? I mean, I'm I'm was a pretty neurotic mom, so I mean. Right, right, right. Okay, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But so at least for you, that's one thing you don't have to worry about. I don't have to worry about but it. But here you are worrying vicariously through others. You shouldn't do that. Uh, yeah, bit of a personality don't, flaw. Don't b- borrow worries from other people. Um, <laughs> no, I do it too. It's yeah, it's easy. Um, 
Do you agree with this decision, Sue, that we're going into this stay-at-home order, given, you know, kind of where we are, 3,000 cases a day, 225 in Ottawa? Is that the new number today? That's two, the number for Ottawa today. So far, it's 225. It, yeah. It's almost um, a record. It's almost the most ever. Like, the record is 240, which was just yeah, which we had a few days ago, right? A few days ago. I guess, I mean, and I think you and I already talked about this. If people are going to break the rules, they're going to break the rules, regardless of what that rule is. Mm-hmm. So, you know, people are, if everyone in my mind, everyone had, you know, socially distanced and washed their heads and wore a mask while they were outside, we wouldn't be facing these same numbers, in my opinion. Right. Not being, not being a doctor, but I just, it doesn't really matter what the rule is if people aren't going to follow it. That's my fear. Right. What do you think about but, this? For the first time, this is the very first time that the Ford government has done this. It's actually going to force the big box retailers. You can only be open if you sell essentials. And everything else that's in your store, um, you know, um, it, it can only be essentials. Grocery and pharmacy goods and anything else that's deemed essential, I guess, by the government. I, right. I think in some ways it's a bit punitive. Um, a bit I punitive. actually haven't given it a lot of thought, but if you're going to let me or, you know, whoever go into a big box store, does it really matter what section of the, the store I'm shopping in? Mm. Okay. Now, I think that there's some thought that they're giving, I mean, I know that- It's more about fairness, up. I think, than anything else, right? Fairness. If we're going to close, say, one of the callers to the program this morning said, um, for example, Costco sells jewelry, um, for example. Mm -hmm. You know, you could buy jewelry at Walmart. I wouldn't suggest that people do that, but, you know, apparently some people do. Um, (laughs) (laughs) Whatever. I don't know if people would be too impressed to know that you got them jewelry from Walmart, but nevertheless. you should you be allowed to buy jewelry? <laughs> Would you be, you know, why should Walmart be allowed to sell jewelry, but the jewelry store is closed, which is, you know, kind of a good point. And you can use that example, you know, with clothing and stationery and uh, recreational products and all, all kinds of different the toys and whatever, right? So. Yes, I mean, I know what the theory be, of it is, but... <laughs> It does seem if if you're going to be in Walmart, then if you wanted to buy jewelry there, if you're buying bananas, you know, is it any more dangerous to go buy jewelry? But I understand it would it would put put the other jewelry stores at a huge disadvantage. So yeah, yeah, yeah. it'll be interesting to see. Let's face it. You're just happy that the garden centers get to stay open. I can't that's, wait. Right, that's your big thing. She it loves is my uh, big thing. spend time in the garden, so that's good. Well, thank goodness. Now, um, uh, this transportation committee meeting is underway, as I mentioned. I, uh, you know, uh, Councillor Menard and I don't see eye to eye on everything. Seriously? <laughs> you may find that hard to believe. But I, I you know, I do, when, when these major road projects are happening, uh, to his point, and this was a good point I thought that came up with, for example, Elgin Street, which was completely torn up and closed for years. You know, if you're going to repave it, you're going to widen it, you're going to give it new sidewalks and bike lanes and everything else that goes into the so-called complete street, why not take, Another ten million. I know it's big money. Okay, and bury the hydro wires. Why not do that? I think it's a very fair question that he's asking here. What what do you think, Sue? Well, I think, like you, not surprisingly, I think it's it's obvious. Yeah, it's totally obvious. If the wires are eventually going to be buried, then do it while they that will save us millions of dollars. I mean, it's ridiculous that thinking anything else frankly but you and i have watched ridiculous meetings so yeah yeah but i mean this frustration has been out there before if we're going to tear up the road to do sewer work underneath um and then we're going to you know uh, pave it over again and then two years later that road is scheduled to be repaved again why don't we just make it all part of one project but why doesn't that also include the hydro wires well of course and as you know this isn't the first time this council or councils in the past have dealt with this sort of issue. Yeah. 
I yeah. mean, it's so, I think to even people on the street who don't want to see more money being spent, this makes sense. Yeah. yeah. Very nice uh, column. Sue's column appears Mondays in the Ottawa Sun now, where she covers city issues, of course. And um, really nice column and a, and a reminder about the loss that Councillor Hubley suffered when he lost his uh, son to suicide. And one of the reasons why that project for CHEO, One Door for Care project, is so important, right, Sue? That was what your most recent column was about. Absolutely. Yeah. Yes. And uh, let's hope it does some good. Yeah, absolutely, because, you know, when it comes to, let's face it, when it comes to people's mental health care now, especially the after the, the year that people have been through, and it's clearly not over yet, Sue, um, you know, people's mental health care, it is deteriorating, and I can only imagine the toll that it must be taking on uh, the emotional well-being of young people. Right. And I mean, I think every, you could look at almost any age group. I, I worry about seniors, you know, and they're, they've I had already lost a lot of freedom because they're older. Right. And uh, now they're stuck in after a lifetime of hard work and they're stuck inside. Okay. That worries me. Thank you for this week, Sue. Great to get caught up with you. I'm glad you're well. Hang in there. Fight the good fight. Okay. Bye-bye. Thanks a lot. Sue Sharing. Read her every Monday, her column in the Ottawa Sun. That's it for the Rob Snow Show for today. We're back right after the 9 o'clock news tomorrow. Mark Sutcliffe Show is coming up next. Noon news. And don't forget, Doug Ford's news conference is at 2. We'll have it for you here on City News. The Rob Snow Show. Tune in. We... This program is brought to you by Ignite TV. Now you're in command.